just smile While the sunshine brings the light Fill me out with a flame I will let you in this year
What is up? How's it going, everybody? <laughs> Even though that there's nobody here right now, but still. Uh, yeah, we're going to start off by playing a game of Risk. And uh, watching a sermon on this week's Bible passage. Montana homeowners, you're going to want to check this out. As of August, and then we'll get into a few news stories. And I've got a list of questions that come up in this series, in particular, going you know through verse by verse teaching. I just take things as they come, and what comes up here is like the Muslim challenge, you know, to, to the Christian belief in the deity of Christ. And I think it's very important that we don't react wrongly to the challenge uh, where we actually say what does this mean like how is it that Jesus doesn't know something didn't know something what does that mean and I've got a list of questions that come up when I enter, encounter this verse and this passage in Mark and we're going to answer those questions today in our Mark series if this is your first time uh, I'm Pastor Mike Winger I teach the Bible I do verse by verse teaching apologetics theology defending the Christian faith explaining the Christian faith responding to a weird theological trends that are going on in our culture and trying to do so with uh, hopefully a, a head and All heart right, that's chasing after Jesus game. and helping you to do the same thing. So um, let's look at this stuff in context. It doesn't refute the deity of Christ, right? But just saying that doesn't refute Jesus's deity, that's not good enough. We have to really understand what this teaches us about the nature or natures, plural, of Christ. Of Christ yes, what are his so. natures and how can we understand them? And I think that this is actually a neat passage because as we'll find, it, it defeats Islam. <laughs> it, not, not only does it does it still teach the deity of Christ, but it actually defeats and destroys Islamic theology. It, you have to understand that one of the core tenets of Islamic theology is that Jesus is not the Son of God. And uh -huh. this verse that is often used by Muslims to try to refute Christianity. Is well, that's like every other religion other than Christianity. So Islam. But let's get into it by just first reading the passage thoughtfully. Consider these things, think about these things, and then we'll, we'll dig deep. We will dig deep today. So Mark 13, 32, it says, But of that day or hour, no one knows. And Jesus is speaking about the hour of his coming, the, the, the end time stuff. He goes, No one knows the day or the hour. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Take heed and keep on the alert, for you do not know when the appointed times will come. Time will come. It is like a man away on a journey who upon leaving his house right. and putting his slaves in charge, assigning to each one his task, also commanded the doorkeeper to and stay the on the alert. Is. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening, at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, in case he should come suddenly and find you asleep. What I say to you, I say to all, Make be on you. the alert. So this is... This is um, yeah, this is it. I, I, I think this is the end of like our eschatology stuff in the Gospel of Mark. I don't know if there's any significant eschatology stuff as I'm scanning in my head real quick. Coming up, uh, not not real significant stuff, no major things uh, for the Gospel of Mark. In particular, this is the final day. We'll deal with some of that stuff as well. Eschatology meaning end times or what Christians think is going to happen in the future. That kind of thing. Um, the that day he's talking about is clearly the day of the coming of Christ. No one knows that. And let's just start by answering the Christological question. The question that has to do with the natures of who Christ is. And I'm using the word natures plural for, for a very specific reason here. 
but I'll explain that later. Um, oh, how could the sun crazy, of God not crazy not know? How could the sun not know? And there are, I'm going to present three theories that people like to offer on this, and we're going to analyze them. I'll defend the third theory. The first two I'll just mention. The first theory is the, the sort of the Muslim theory or the theory that is often carried by those who, are, who don't believe in the, in the deity of Christ. And they will say, like I mentioned to you earlier, right, God is omniscient. That's premise one in their argument. Premise two is Jesus is not omniscient, right? There's something he doesn't know. And then conclusion, therefore, Jesus is not God. And it seems like a really tight, logical argument. And in a sense, it is. But I would suggest that you guys first notice this. Um, Bro, this does he hit my tent? That would that be wild. Scripture's teaching you that Jesus isn't God. Rather, it's an argument that, that says, sucks. Scripture's teaching you Jesus didn't know something. And I'm telling you, logically, <laughs> he cannot What a God. noob. So you get this. This is not an argument that the Bible teaches Jesus isn't God. This is important. It's an argument that the incarnation is logically impossible. That's a different argument, and it's a much more bold argument than people realize. And that's actually its weakness. It's really an argument that the incarnation is impossible. Yet if we have scripture that teaches that Jesus is God and teaches that Jesus also didn't know something, then we have the full biblical teaching that Jesus is God and there was something he didn't know. And we have to explain that. I agree. We have to explain that. But you can't say that he therefore can't be God. That's your, your philosophy being forced upon scripture. You're not letting scripture speak at that point. So um, that to me is not a very powerful argument, Ooh. but we'll answer it as well as we go on. Uh, now, a second theory, a second theory of the three is, and this I think was Martin Luther's position on the topic, but it's also been held by various people in church Martin history, Luther. is that this just doesn't mean what you think it means. When it says that no one knows the day or the hour, the son doesn't know, it's just a, a, a figure of speech. And what Jesus is really saying here is not that he's not cognizant or aware of when this time is going to be. Instead, he's saying that it's not him who's deciding the time. He's not choosing the time. Um, now, in other words, it's when, when he says, I don't know, he's really mean, saying, it's not in my authority. And they go to Acts chapter 1, because in Acts 1, Jesus says, the authority of when this time will come is in the Father's hands. It's in the Father. It's the Father who's deciding when it will happen. Um, this is not actually a very popular theory, you know, it, and it doesn't look like it works. Like, it looks like you're just trying to get away from it, because then you don't even have Jesus not knowing something. You can say Jesus is fully omniscient at all times, in all ways. And um, he, he's, he's presently aware of the time and hour. It, you just mi misread the passage. I don't think this works with the passage, though. I don't think it works with the passage at all. I'm not going to go into a big, long thing about it, but just look at it. He goes, I don't know, you don't know. And their question is, when is it going to happen? When's it going to happen? He goes, you don't know, I don't know. Only, only the Father knows. The context of all that isn't about, they're not saying, Jesus, who gets to pick when it happens? There's, that's not what they're asking him. They're asking when, and he tells them, no one knows. So the context doesn't work with the authority claim. And the word no here probably doesn't fit that either. So the third response, which I think is the right response, the right theory or interpretation of Jesus not knowing the day or the hour, is to say that this is just how the incarnation works. This is, and, and keep, hear me out, that's how the incarnation, that, that phrase incarnation, it means in the flesh or in a body. Jesus comes in a human body that's just how it works when God comes in human form. It, it works that way because he's truly human. Now, our tendency, this is something we're not used to, and I wasn't used to it years ago. Uh, we tend to want to defend the deity of Christ. And, and you might look at this passage and think, how do I defend the deity of Christ? But, but really, this passage is about helping to reassure us of the humanity of Christ. It's not a challenge to his deity because Christian doctrine has always held that Jesus is God and man two natures mm -hmm. right he has he's he's deity and human both so if he's god and man this passage is giving us both in one verse he's the son of the father and he's also a human um, our tendency again is to emphasize the deity of christ and to think that the battlegrounds are all about the deity of jesus and i think because of this we sometimes are a little bit less grateful for what jesus did when he came in his humility and how, i mean how much our lord suffered for us how much jesus really went through it's not like jesus was like superman like if you watch the old old superman christopher reeves right you watch the old superman he'll like pretend he gets hurt or that he can't carry something or lift something but we all know it's a joke because he's not really being hurt He's, he's not being injured at all. There's no suffering. There's no difficulty going on for him. He's just pretending to be a normal human. That's what Clark, Clark Kent's not a real person. Not a, it's just a fabrication. And some 
would would picture Christ as though he was just he just looked like he was in human form. He didn't really come and take on actual humanity. That was actually an early church heresy. This is something that was going on in the. If in the you very don't early move church, that I'll, I'll one more turn, this, this next Bible turn, I'm fucking really hitting the it. Humanity of Jesus. He was truly a human, and he was truly God. Both are true. So let me point out some other areas in the scripture where you might have missed this, and you need to absorb this. This is what the Bible is telling us about the nature of Christ. Not only is there something he didn't know, let me add more. Let me make the problem bigger <laughs> so you realize you have to accept it. Uh, Luke 2.52, Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Jesus increased in wisdom. Now, this is Jesus when he's 12. In Luke 2, he's 12. He visits the temple. He's there having discussions with the leaders and teachers. And he, he then grows from 12 until the next time you see him in, in any of the Gospels, right? Especially Luke. He's like, he's like about 30 years old. And it tells us about the in-between time. It just says he increased in wisdom. Now, how can God increase in wisdom? I mean, how can even Jesus increase in wisdom? He is the wisdom of God, Scripture tells us. First Corinthians, right? He's, he's God's wisdom. He is the way, the truth, and the life. How can he increase in wisdom? I'm going to say what we have to do is grant he can increase in wisdom. And our question is how, not whether he does or not, because he, clearly he does. He cannot know something. We just have to ask how that works with our understanding of who Jesus is. And the answer is just what the church has believed about the, the incarnation for a very long time. Another spot here is Matthew 4.2. I think this is um, another significant passage that you should think about. And after he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. Now, this may not seem like that's significant. He became hungry. So, you know, Jesus became hungry because humans can become hungry. Yet God doesn't get hungry. God's never like, boy, I need to eat or I will die. That doesn't happen to God because in his deity, there's no need. But when he took on humanity, the humanness of Christ had a need to eat. So he's human. Like there's, there's actually like a true humanity that's going on here. Mm -hmm. um, now, the error is in thinking that Jesus is only human, that that's all he is, that if he's human, he can't be God, that he can't be both. The Bible clearly, te clearly teaches he's both. It just straight up calls Jesus God in places. Yeah. And and then some people go, well, why didn't Jesus say, I am God, and use those exact words? And I'm just like, this is a great way for you to ignore what Jesus actually said. <laughs> this is not this is not clever. This this is right up there with the word Trinity is not found in the Bible, which is like literally a, a total distraction from the issue. The doctrine tr of the Trinity is taught in the Bible. That's the issue. Mm -hmm. That's the only question we have. Um, at any rate, here's a question to, to show you, demonstrate the humanity of Christ to us all, right? How much do you think Jesus could bench press? Think about it. How much could he bench press? Now, I, I Googled real quick, like, what's the typical weight someone could bench press? So I, I, I you know, I, I went on the upper end for average and said 180, right, Jesus? Because I want to make him, I want to make him strong, you know? Some people want to make him really kind of a sissy, like the Renaissance artists that just make everyone into girly, girly guys. <laughs> there was like a weird thing where the holier somebody was, the more feminine they made them. Um, I, actually, that's coming back <laughs> in our culture today. So the idea, though, is Jesus, like, let's say he could bench press 180 pounds, right? He, but that's humanly. I mean, he's... He's God. He could just command the moon to explode and it would. Mm -hmm. That's it. Like, there's no limit to what he could bench press in his divine power. But in his human abilities, there's a limit. That's the simple answer to this question. How could Jesus not know and know at the same time? There's more we'll have to discuss, but I think that gets you going. There's a human, there's a true human nature in Christ. All right, I'm glad. He could do anything, but he limited himself. He didn't access, he didn't use those powers. He tried to, uh, in, in most cases, using his human abilities... And we'll talk more about the details of how that plays out in a second. Um, now let's talk about how this <clears throat> works. It I need to get to him the bench press example. I think. I think I'm gonna get him out of my bon out of my bonus so he doesn't keep placing material in there. It's wasting a lot of material for me though. At the same time, uh, don't like that. That they go. Yeah, humanly he can bench press a certain amount. Divinely he can do any anything. But when you talk about his knowledge, this is where it feels different, right? feels like when you say he couldn't lift that rock that size, but divinely he could. If you say that, I get that. But with, with his knowledge, it feels a little different. Um, but in scripture, there's times where Jesus seems to know things supernaturally. He seems to have a supernatural knowledge. I'll give you several examples. The Gospel of John is, is a, the easiest place to find the specific uh, verses. John 2.24, but Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them all, to them, for he knew all men. 
So there's some sort of sense in which he knows all men. Uh, he knows their basic nature. He understands them. There's a sense in which Jesus knows people that goes, I think, beyond the natural. Does there's he like hit a, like my 17? No. There. In Matthew okay. 4, 2, we can read about it again. I'm oh, sorry, um, John 6, 64. So Jesus talks about how some of them don't believe, but then look at the commentary on this. Right? Why would John's he have hit so much? Led by the Spirit, he writes, For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. Now, think about this. The things that Jesus did know divinely, like Judas is going to betray me, they're going to crucify me. They're going to drive nails through my hands. They're going to beat me. My own people will betray me. Peter will deny me three times. These things are the things he supernaturally knows. The stuff he did know was like hard stuff to deal with and know. What he doesn't know at that time is the day and the hour of his return. It's interesting because that's the glorious moment. Th this meant that Jesus' knowledge would have been a hardship for him in some in some cases, in many cases, the things he did divinely know. He knew what was in man. I don't even want to know. Is he going to put right? his stuff <laughs> I in there? Know what's in me. Or like, is he going to put. I am only sustained by the grace of God every right. moment. Um, cool. That knowledge is not pleasurable knowledge to really know what's in the heart of man. So mm -hmm. it just that, that just strikes me as being an additional struggle that Jesus went through that many of us don't appreciate. So in Jesus' knowledge, he seems to know certain things. Like in the passages I just I just gave you, he seems to know things. Um, he knew who it was who would betray him. And then in uh, John 1, we have an interesting example of him having like sort of supernatural knowledge or awareness of Nathaniel. Nathaniel comes uh, to meet him and Jesus says, Behold, is an Israelite indeed in whom there's no deceit. Nathaniel says, How do you know me? Jesus answered and tells him, Hey, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. I saw you. And there he was, uh, impossible to physically see him. And Nathaniel just immediately goes, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You're the king of Israel. Like, this is all the evidence he needs. Like, you knew I was under the fig tree. Uh, this was a uh, knowledge that proved the identity of Christ to Nathaniel. Um, that was supernatural knowledge. Okay, in John 16, 30, in John 21, 17, also Philip and Peter both state that Jesus knows all things. All things. So there's some sense in which Jesus is omniscient. But there's another sense in which Jesus doesn't know. Now, that's a full biblical teaching. If you want to be one of those who wants to try to chop the Bible up and try to make it contradict, be my guest. Shit. Don't call that Christianity. If you have a biblical view, if you have a Christian view, you must affirm that Jesus knew all things. And there was at least one thing, perhaps several things, he did not know. At the same time, how do you affirm this? It's the two natures of Christ. He has divine nature. He has human nature. This, this is my th thought on these things. The way the Bible teaches about God, about the Father, the Holy Spirit, and the Son, it forces upon you the doctrine of the Trinity and the doctrine of the two natures of Christ with, with one person. These, that's, that's the historical Christian you know, creeds and stuff is that Jesus has two natures, divine and human, but there's only one person who is Jesus, right? Two natures, but one person. Just as there are in the Trinity, there's three persons, but one God. It's not three persons equal one person. It's three persons, one God. Anyway, this is, this is forced upon you by the teaching of Scripture. Here, Jesus' Jesus's identity as God and man is being forced upon us by this idea of his omniscience and his lack of knowledge at the same time. It's not a contradiction because it's by virtue of different natures that he is, by virtue of his divinity, he's omniscient. By virtue of his humanity, he can have limited knowledge. Uh, one way to put this is limited, limiting himself in his access to his knowledge. So I'll put it this way. Jesus voluntarily limited his use of power and his use of his divine knowledge as part of the incarnation. Humanly, Jesus did not know the day or the hour and chose not to access that divine omniscience, which would have given him the answer. He could have had it. Someone's trying to call me, but I don't care about them. Actually, I, it's probably spam. <laughs> Um, so, um, I do care about them, but I'm not going to answer the call. They don't, because someone's like, don't know, you don't know I'm joking. I don't actually not care about people. I care about everybody. I love everybody perfectly in every possible way. That was also a joke. If you can't tell. So he, uh, voluntarily limits the use of divine power. This is again, just the two natures. The Bible affirms both of these Christians have to affirm both of these. And if you affirm both of these answering the question of how Jesus couldn't know something or didn't know something is easy. It's easy. Right? The incarnation, the doctrine of the, of the Trinity, the doctrine of the two natures of Christ. This is a solution to what the scripture keeps pushing on us with who Jesus is. 
it's however something that's missed as i've said earlier is missed on on us like us 21st century christians is that we tend to forget that the humanity of jesus knowing that he's truly human is maybe equally important as knowing he's truly divine he's god with us but you, you can't just emphasize the deity you have to emphasize the humanity of christ in the early church this was a huge issue there were those who actually taught that Jesus was not even really a human. So you all know the footprints in the sand story, which, which I like. Okay, I, I, it's, it, now if you think it's scripture, that's weird, right? But I think it's a wonderful poem that teaches a lesson that, that reminds us of the truth. Like, I, I like footprints in the sand. I don't think that's people. So we're all so, so critical of everything nowadays. Um, but, but I like it. I think it's great. So um, I don't want to stretch it too far, but I think it's good. But there is an old footprints in the sand. There's like a second century footprints in the sand story. Did you know this? It's in a Gnostic gospel. Now, if you haven't heard of this, when I say Gnostic gospel, Gnostic is a religious group, not Christians. They would pretend that other religions were, you know, they would pretend to be Christian. They're totally not Christian. But they have a Gnostic gospel, meaning, you know, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, they would write some of their own. They'd be like, well, this is the gospel of Peter. This is the gospel of Judas. This is the gospel of Mary. And they would write these fabricated fake or forged gospels to try to put their teachings in there because they're trying to draw Christians away to their false beliefs. So if they can attach their beliefs to Jesus, then they win, right? Well, these gospels, um, none of them are in your Bible, of course. They're all just, you could read them in church history. You could, you could find them online for free even. Though. And they're weird reading, that's for sure. One of them tells a story of a, a disciple walking with Jesus on the sand, footprints in the sand. And they're walking on the sand and Jesus walks with them. And at some point, the disciple turns back and he looks. And ironically, he only sees one set of footprints. Isn't that interesting? Except in this version of footprints in the sand, it's not Jesus's footprints. The footprints he sees are his own. And the revelation, the Gnostic thought, is Jesus, he left no footprints because he wasn't really human, because he wasn't really there. This was something that was going on in the early church, the teaching that Jesus was never really human at all. He was just the sort of like manifestation of divinity here in some sense, or an emanation of part of the Pleroma if you're if you're Gnostic. And Whoa, so what the fuck? Don't worry about all that. Forget about it. I'll do it some other day. But first John four verses two and three reveals to us like the early church responding to this. Probably dealing with some of the proto or early beginnings of Gnosticism. Uh, John writes, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Right? That's the incarnation. He came in the flesh. Carne, carne asada. Right? We're talking about meat. He came in actual human form. This is this is emphasized not only, like, it's essential. Like, he goes, you deny the, 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 the humanity of Christ. You are not, it's not from God. This is This should have defeated Gnosticism for anybody who would take the authentic writings of the, of the scriptures. But um, the, uh, this is something Jesus also reemphasized after his resurrection. Not only did he live a human life, die, physically rise from the dead, but then he, he like has, goes to great lengths to show the, the disciples, like, it's me. He tells them it's not a ghost. He goes, give me some food, and he eats in front of them. He's doing all these things to show them he's real. This is, he's not just hungry. He's trying to demonstrate, I'm physically, bodily raised to life because he's truly human. This is how Jesus can represent you and me on the cross. Right? Adam represents us in the garden. Jesus represents us in the cross. Just as we get drugged down in the fall of Adam, we rise up with Christ when we trust in him because he is the new Adam, the second Adam, the human to represent all humans, the one to stand in our place. His humanity is really stinking important. And that's what this verse is helping to show us. There's something he didn't know. Why? Because he really did limit himself in ways as a human. So that that's pretty significant. Um, let's... talk now about how unaware Jesus was. Here's one of the questions I come up with. And for you guys who want like Bible study tips, here's a, here's a tip. Um, read a passage and then write down, just write down a list of questions that come up as you read the passage. I think questions are better than observations. Usually people go observe, interpret, apply. And I think observation is a difficult step for people and it's not in terribly fruitful a lot of the time. I would, uh, to be honest, <laughs> um, not that it's a bad idea. It's just pragmatically it not, may not be the best way to do observing. It, observing is to say, make observations. I say ask questions uh, because 
I have to observe to, to ask questions. And then I'm asking questions of the passage. It forces me to go back to the passage to look for those answers. So one of the questions I wrote down re looking at this passage was how unaware was Christ? Like, how unaware was he? To what degree? And, and here's um, my theory on how this worked. My All theory right. is this, that Jesus would would limit himself. Can a, a, a I kill? Purpose. Okay, this Ooh, is I, that's going to be, I have to be really good dice to kill him. Should I? I do get a set afterwards. But if I don't, I'm screwed. think there could be different ways of trying to you know piece together the gray areas here um, so my thought is this jesus generally kept himself from his omniscience like like closing your eyes you know and not using that vision that you have that ability you're just not using it so he he just kept himself from it having a human mind a human brain i should say excuse me i don't want to get into the mind discussion but a human brain that that is limited in its capacities would allow him an easy avenue for limiting access to his own omniscience. But I think that when he did access omniscience, it was at the Father's instruction, specifically. So like God the Father, he's in constant submission, being an example for us. He's specifically moment to moment getting instruction, knowledge, direction from the Father. It may come from his own power, but I think it's coming at the permission of the Father, right? I, I think that that's it. Um, I just watched Incredibles the other day. Let me give you an example that just popped into my mind. Here's an analogy from a movie that's not Lord of the Rings. Um, so I watched Incredibles, and at the end of the film, there's the the son, um, Dash. Right, his name's Dash. It's a great movie, by the way. Incredibles was. Does he not trade? Uh, oh, he doesn't son, trade. Dash, he, he, he. Okay, he I kill race, him. But he's like faster than anybody in the world, right? So his parents don't want him to overdo it, and so during the race, he's running, and he keeps looking at his dad and his mom. Okay, I think I just kill him this this turn. Because I get a 10 set. Because fuck this guy. Mom. To get he's too stupid to know how fast he what to run. do. And they're like, go faster. And he gets ahead. And they're like, oh, no, slow down, slow down, not that fast. And they tell him, come in second, close second. And then he's just, he could easily race off as fast as he wants, but he's listening and submitting to their instruction. I think this is a cheesy example, I admit. But I think that it's an illustration that might help me make my point about Jesus receiving moment-to-moment -moment direction from the Father about what he would do or not do, when he would heal, when he would not heal. I think he has the power to do those things. Fuck! I wasn't able to kill him. Maybe you should have fucking got out of my place, you dumb cunt. It. I kept telling you to get the fuck now, why out. Why do I say this? Uh, John 5.19... John 5, 19, it says, Jesus speaking himself, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son does also does in like manner. This active sense of the verb he sees, this is like an ongoing seeing. So it's not just that Jesus was following a plan that was laid out ahead of time. In some cases, that's true. When it comes to the cross, Jesus knows well ahead of time. He prophesies it. He talks about the details of it. He's going to die and rise again. He's not in the dark about his mission. But it may be that moment to moment that he goes somewhere, and while he's there, God, re the Father, reveals to him, this is the thing that I'm wanting you to do right now. And he just does it in the moment, which is like perfect obedience moment to moment. Then um, we have uh, John eight twenty eight that may also support this. 
When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and I do not, and I do nothing Again. on my own initiative, but I speak the things, these things, as the Father taught me. So He doesn't do it under His own initiative. Jesus is being initiated by the Father. That that's what I'm say, suggesting. That guy annoyed sort of moment me. Moment to moment direction and directives. So, in that moment, the Father's like, this knowledge is not for you to have right now. And the son, who is God in the flesh, is so humble as to not just access that knowledge, which he could access. I should have done sense. some uh, I manuals. Think that's pretty interesting. I think it's consistent scripturally, and I think it makes a lot of sense of when Jesus would use a supernatural ability versus not. I think that's right. Yeah, there. I should have done manuals now, on notice the, this. Mark drops on a, a 16. A, we've seen that in the Mark stupid series, of you guys me. been following with me in the whole series. And there's a playlist down below if you want to check out the entire. That was really series. dumb of but, me. Mark drops these subtle bombs, the Gospel of Mark, these subtle bombs uh, that are just like deep and meaningful and powerful teaching about the deity and person of Christ. And this, again, this is one of those passages. As, as much as people want to use it to fight the deity of Jesus, it actually teaches his deity as well as his humanity. It teaches both. It's only a problem if you think you have to pick between the two. Mm -hmm. But notice the order that we have here in Mark 13. This is so cool. And if a Muslim asks you about this passage, this is what you need to respond. This is like your response has All got right. to involve what I'm about uh, to tell you right now. Uh, okay, so it looks like that purple or, is or going hour, to no take. One knows. So he says no one knows. That implies no humans know. This is humans hearing, but their first thought is no people know. They're not thinking of angels or, or you know, spirit beings. They're not thinking of animals. They're thinking of people. No one knows. Then the next step up, not even the angels in heaven. That's above people angels know more than you generally speaking right then he goes up another step nor the sun why is that significant for a few reasons one if you're muslim uh, then it is considered shirk one of the worst sins in islam for you to declare that jesus is the son of god yet in this very passage that muslims most frequently want to use um, to try to say jesus wasn't god's son i mean that's their ultimate goal here okay it teaches it so i'm jesus going to place he's the son and who, whose son is he of the Father, which means God. He's God. He's the Son of God. This is a Son of God passage in, indisputably. Um, even people who are like the Next critical phase, scholars, the ones boom. who want to like really chop the Gospels up and just remove most of them and be like, yeah, Jesus didn't really say that. Even, even those people who I think are off boom. the rocker, <laughs> they would say, this is an authentic saying of Jesus. Like, you can't find any way to support the idea that Jesus didn't say the whole phrase. That's pretty significant. So, you know, if a Muslim says, well, how come Jesus didn't know the day or hour? You have to ask them, so do you believe that Jesus said that? And if they say yes, then you can respond with, so Jesus is the son of God. Um, Does it hit my seven? That. It's Islam that oh. can handle this verse. It's not Christianity that can handle this verse. No, not at all. All right. Now, there's also now I move that theology. seven all the so way up off, in. No one knows that's humans. Not even the angels. Take that's the that next level two. Up. Then, boom, not even the boom. sun, nor the sun. That means the sun is higher than the angels. The sun is higher than the angels. You could read Mark with this one question in your mind that will change your understanding of the gospel, Mark. Who does he think he is? He commands demons. He talks about having his own angels. He, he does things under his own authority. He, he wow. says his words, and then he uses a term that describes God's words, where he goes, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. That, dude, that's scripture for God's words, not your words. And mm -hmm. here he calls himself the son of the father, who's apparently above humans and angels. There he is way up there. Either Jesus is an egomaniac, or he is the son of God, right? Like, either he is a lunatic. He is the son so of God. Of himself, or he's God with us. Now, to show you how important this is, this claim that he's higher than angels Look at Hebrews 1 with me. This is like the passage written, I think, Hebrews 1. Partly was written just to deal with Jehovah's Witness theology for whenever it did finally come around. Hebrews 1, verse 5. We're going to read through this. Look at what it says. Uh, here Hebrews 1 is comparing Jesus to angels. Jesus compared to angels. And notice how it, it exalts him. He's God. Okay, this is a this is a Jesus is God passage. And he's greater than the angels. Um, for to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. God doesn't say this to the angels. This is something about Jesus. He's the son of the father, and that's unique to Jesus. It's unique to Jesus. Verse 6, and when again, when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, uh, and let all the angels of God worship him. 
let the angels worship him. Okay, wait, whoa. All the angels are to worship him? Who is this? Uh, he's kind of dumb. He shouldn't have left that eight there. He should he should have seen this and gone, oh, he needs to move up into there. Because now I just have a fucking... Uh, oh, I got an idea. Oh, shit. You fucked me. Does he move that eight? No, he doesn't. Okay. Weird. Greater than the angels, they're to worship him. This is These are words you usually use to describe God, right? Verse seven, it gets stronger as we go. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire, right? They're not physical and embodied and they're, and they're servants. That's the nature of them. That's the nature of angels. They're not physical and embodied, and they're servants. They're ministers. That word is to serve. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and righteousness is the scepter of his kingdom. So, of the Son, catch this. God the Father says about the Son, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Not only is he not an angel, he is, he's God who sits on God's throne. Yeah, and you could debate this passage. I have, in my Trinity uh, teaching, I deal with this passage in more detail for those who try to re-translate it differently and stuff. But verse 9, You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. Again, he's called God. Verse 10, it gets worse for those who don't, don't see the deity of Christ in Scripture. And you, Lord. Notice that Lord. Notice how it's this, like, capital L, lowercase, capital O-R-D. Um, this is in, in the actual Hebrew, in the, in the passage that's being quoted from the Old Testament, this is the word Yahweh. And everything that's being said in context in Hebrews 1 is about the Son. It's the Father says these things about the Son. So here's, you know, he's of the Son, he says, and it has a quote. Then it says, and, which would be and what? He, of the Son, he says this, and he says this, and he says this. They're all things God, the Father says of the Son. You, Lord, you, Yahweh, in the beginning lay the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work, works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, they, and they all will become old like a garment. Anyway, it, it goes on. The idea in Hebrews 1 um, is that Jesus is greater than the angels, and the significance of that is because he is God. He is God. He is, and, and here we have, in a sense, we oh, have God four talking troops. to himself, right? But that's because we have multiple persons in God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Trinity just makes sense of all these doctrines, of all these teachings and scriptures. It's forced upon us. But some would respond, and they would say, I want to push back on that, Mike. Uh, in Job chapter 1, it actually does say that angels are sons of God. In Job 1, maybe I can quickly find the verse for you guys. Um, here we are in Job 1. Um, here we go. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. These are some kind of angelic beings. Is what it, That's how I understand Job, and I think most people do. Uh, so in Job 1.6, they're called sons of God. Um, okay, first off, let me just say, the Bible is not written by one author or in one time. It's inspired by one, one ins ins inspirer, right, God? But it is written over a vast period of time, and terms are used in different ways. So the term sons of God in Job 1.6 is referring to angels. They're called sons of God. But this is not at all the kind of exaltation language we get, say, in Hebrews 1. Look at what it says. In Hebrews 1.5, for which, to which of the angels did he ever say, not you're all categorized as sons of God, meaning like you're, you're, 
you're my servants. You're the, you're the ones who serve me and all that. Instead, he actually says, you are my son today. I've begotten you. I will be a father to him and he shall be a son to me. Even the terminology of the New Testament, it describes Jesus as the only begotten son. So clearly Jesus is different than the angels. Job is just using the term in a very different fashion and it shouldn't be ported over out of context into <sighs> Hebrews or into Mark for that matter for uh, to be used out of context. Jesus is clearly a son in a very different and very unique sense. And Job, Hebrews 1 just straight up affirms that he is God. Now, this verse contains the paradox I mentioned earlier um, with, with the Muslims, but I want to talk about it a little bit more. Uh, of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the son. Uh, <laughs> I get excited about this stuff. Sorry. Uh, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son. That's, that's one issue people, they're like bothered by. Conservatives sometimes have been bothered by the lack of knowledge that Jesus mentions here. But what's interesting is, you don't know this, is that liberals are also bothered by it for a different Oh, reason. what the fuck? Um, here I'm speaking conservative, liberal, in theological terms here. Most of us are often hearing the term Five. Holy it, shit. They mean things I can't believe that I did that. I'm referring to. I've had it on the wrong... Okay. I can't so believe the, that the I did that. Theologians, um, they're going to be wow. bothered by this as well but for a different reason, right? They're not bothered that Jesus doesn't know the day or the hour. They tend to like that sort of thing, right? Because they tend to like de-spiritualize, de-supernaturalize the Bible. But they're bothered by something else, right? Liberals are worried that Jesus is too personally aware of his sonship with the Father. Oh, I forgot to put it on the screen for you. Jesus is too aware of his sonship with the Father. It bothers them that Jesus is like openly saying that he's the son of God. Right? He, he doesn't call himself son of man in this passage. He calls himself like the son of the father. It, contextually, he can only be talking about God because he calls God the father in the very next uh, couple words. That's pretty significant. And liberals are bothered by this. And then again, this makes it ironic that Muslims use it because it affirms the thing they all want to deny. That Jesus was the son of God. And for the liberals to hear this, that Jesus knew he was the son of God. Because some of them want to act like Christianity is something that happened after Jesus' time and was sort of forced onto him, right? Like this was this was uh, right. the rise of, of Christianity came after, or, or some would say, oh, Paul hijacked Christianity and all this kind of thing. And these are all nonsense claims that can be talked about at length at other times. But here's one of those places that helps us push back on such claims. So th that's the paradox of the verse. And, and how, now how, how would a Christian respond? Well, we'd respond by just acknowledging all of it. Jesus didn't know. There was something he did not know. And he's the son of God. They're both true, right? He's human. He's divine. He's both. That's the biblical view. That's even this very verse is pushing it on us. And we need to just accept it all. He's both God and man. The two natures of Christ is the solution to this problem. He's human. He's truly human, truly divine. Uh, just as a reminder for those who maybe haven't heard me say it, I, I don't recommend saying he's 100% human and 100% God. The word percent is a clumsy phrase and depending on how you take it you've made him into 200 percent which doesn't make sense on any reading of math right he's 200 percent of what wait i'm so it's just the terms percentage right truly human genuinely human he was actually human and he was actually truly god right that there's a genuineness in those claims uh, that's the emphasis that christians should have and it's right here in the bible it's not just an invention uh, at the council of nicaea for those who are very unaware of history you might think that um did jesus do everything as a man this is another question i want to ask this kind of came up because i i realize that there are those who are say part of and i've been openly i've discussed bethel uh, not because i'm mad at people at bethel or something i love them They're my brothers and sisters in christ for the most part they really are i believe that um but i openly discuss them because i feel like their influence is growing in the world and there's some elements of their teaching that are off and i'd like for people to at least hear another voice on the issue Right? I think that's a healthy thing for us to hear multiple voices. So one of the teachings that we get in, say, Bethel or from guys like Todd White, um, we get the teaching that Jesus did everything as a man and that this implies that whatever we see Jesus doing, we can sort of do the same thing. You know, when the rubber meets the road, this means that you can just go around and everyone, every Christian should expect to have direct words from the Lord, to prophesy, to do miracles everywhere you go. You should be able to clear out hospitals. Like this is the expectation that's being set. Now, they're not meeting that expectation at all, but that's the expectation that's constantly being taught and preached. And I think that it's a distortion of 
what scripture says, but I don't want to overreact. Now, some have overreacted, I think, to Bethel by suggesting Jesus didn't do anything as a man or something like that. Like, that's like, no, no, the humanity of Christ is super important. I want to have that there. What I don't want to do is is turn it into like a funhouse mirror where and Fucking that's what I think asshole. Bethel does with Jesus. Okay, I think that there's the real the real Jesus is there, but he's being looked at through a funhouse mirror where we overinflate certain aspects and under represent others and that that creates anxiety in the body of christ when it comes to things like miracles because we're expecting things but the the, the same way that and i've criticized before um some within my own with my own group of churches movement of, of having overly predicting the future to the point of being embarrassing right they get so excited about predicting when the end times are going to come and how, what's going to lead to the mark of the beast, which I find to just be a bunch of a very reckless business that I think causes harm. But they're ex it's exciting in a sense. Bethel, their excitement, their distortion relates to miracles and supernatural things. OBS is so much connecting so much of those things that we will then. Okay, OBS reconnected I, I successfully. Um, but there is a teaching called kenosis that I want to mention real quick kenosis Th this is this is a teaching that i as far as i know bethel doesn't hold it now but don't take my word for it because i haven't read all their books if they hold it this is a, this is a heresy okay if people are holding this teaching it's absolutely heresy and that would be the opposite of um what i talked about earlier this would be to deny not the humanity of christ but to deny the deity of christ so that what? jesus kenosis doesn't say jesus oh, what a piece of shit right? the kenosis says that, that that god the word right he became flesh and he basically ceased being God at that point. Now, some say it clearly like that. He stopped being God. He, he did everything as a man. What they really mean in that case is he was just a man. Uh, others will, will say it a different way. They'll say, well, he's still God in a sense, but he just, he lacks Attack, the attributes right. of God. He's not, no, no, I mean. he's not omnipresent. He's not omnipotent. He's not all-powerful. He's not any of those things. Oops. Now, if he actually lacks the, see, I'm saying he doesn't use those attributes. I'm not saying he doesn't have them. There's a difference there, right? If Jesus, though, he doesn't even have the attributes of what we what looks like it's essential to be God is to be omni, omni, all these things, right? And if he doesn't have those, then he just seems to not be God anymore. And that would be kenosis. This is a, 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 it comes from the Philippians where it says he emptied himself. And then they take that word and they label the doctrine with that. But they define emptying as he just like was no longer, he no longer had those attributes. Now, I don't think that's right. That's not what scripture is teaching. And it's what the church has historically always said is like straight up heresy. Um, Bethel does flirt with that a little bit, but they, I don't think that they're teaching it. I hope not. I sure hope not. Um, maybe oh. if I read more of their material, I'd find more clarity on that. I got that. request. I know a lot of you guys are convinced that they're teaching it. I haven't what seen is he it in doing? actual works. Okay, so as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's a rumor until I know for sure that it's there. And so, I'm, so I help you out, but you you're not going to help me. People in a movement that has some uh, some issues if we won't represent them accurately. And I want to make sure I do that with, uh, with Bethel. So here's how your debate goes. Did Jesus know or did he not know? But the Muslim challenges you, did he know or did he not know? Did he know or did he not know? If he was God, he would know. But it says here he didn't know, so therefore he can't be God. And so I want you guys to do me a favor. And, and I would, you could ask someone to do that, uh, to do this as well if they ask you this question. Is you ask them to do this, and you don't have to do what you want. You're in control. <laughs> but uh, I'd ask you to close your eyes. Close your eyes right now. Um, and assuming you're watching video and you're not listening to a podcast, this would work for you if you're on video. So close your eyes for a moment. Don't do it if you're driving, please. Um, <laughs> and uh, close your eyes for a minute, and I'll ask you the question. Can you see me with your eyes closed? Can you see me right now? And you would have to answer, no, I can't see you right now. I don't see you. But if I was to conclude you lack the ability to see me, that would be a wrong conclusion because you have self-limited your ability to see by closing your eyes. I think that Jesus can do this with his knowledge, right? He has the ability to close his, himself off to the knowledge he has. Now, we can sort of do this as humans. I'm much more limited, you know. I can kind of like try not to think about something. I can avoid thinking about a thing. Sometimes there are even things that I know that I just can't bring to my mind. And it may have been like that. It may have been that Jesus knows that somewhere he knows this, but he's not bringing it to his mind because he has the human limitations he's subjecting himself to on purpose, like closing your eyes. And in that same, you can open your eyes again, by the way. <laughs> in that same sense, though, the... Um, uh, Purple socks, The bro. idea here is that, that Jesus could have had like sort of, you know, there is knowledge he has, but he's not accessing it now. 
And in that sense, he's like, the son does not know. I don't know. That's pretty significant. I think that actually makes a lot of sense. I have this all the time. Sometimes in Q&As, I'll be asking, asked a question and I'll think, man, I did a whole project on this. I have the knowledge back there. And it'll be after the Q&A, like a day later, I'll be like, is he just going to attack only stuff. my and, territories? And for me, in my head, it's almost like I open a, a, a folder and all of a sudden all this information floods out. So it's like, I can't remember anything about it. And then suddenly I remember everything about it. But I had the knowledge. It was always there. I just couldn't access it. We're familiar with that kind of thing. I think Jesus is experiencing something similar to that. He can know the hour, right? He has omniscience. He can use it, but he chooses to have a self-imposed limitation so he doesn't know it. All right, here's the next question. Does Jesus know now? Here's another question I had as I was prepping for my study, right? Does Jesus know now, right now? Does Jesus know the time of his return? Now, some would say no. Maybe he doesn't know. Maybe he continues to have self-imposed limitations. And I'm okay with that. Theologically, I'm okay with that. But I'm going to build a case. I'm going to call it a case, right? It, it, it's what not is he doing? But I think it gives us direction. I think this is in the direction of suggesting yes. Okay. Jesus knows. Okay. Okay, so Philippians 2. Okay. I'm going to share with you three passages of Scripture about this. Um, speaking of who Christ is, what he's like, he was... Um, existed in the form of God. Okay, there's the deity of Christ, clearly. Did not regard equality God, with God a thing to be grasped, so he chose to come become lower than God. Just as it says, the Father's greater than I. He lowers himself, right? He's right there, but he lowers himself. But emptied himself. He emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. So we get the description of Jesus coming from heaven to earth here. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Now we get what happens after the cross, right? He came, he humbled himself, came down, he emptied himself. But what happens next? For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name so that every name uh, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What I'm going to suggest for my first piece in my puzzle of, of um, building a case that Jesus knows now when the hour of his return is going to be and, just, and I could be wrong here, This is, but here's my case, is that in principle, Jesus did this like down up thing. And we get this in Philippians where it talks about he emptied himself and then he died, he rose, he's glorified. There's a glorification. We see it in the Gospels where the glorified risen Christ, there's something different uh, about him now. He's not the same as when he was on the earth. Right. So here's the first piece in the puzzle. Things changed after the resurrection of Christ. Things changed in relation to Jesus' glory, in relation to Jesus having emptied himself. Right, that, that he, he set those things aside or re refused to use those things and took on human form. There's something different now. He's glorified. So that's the first piece in the puzzle. Um, he's still human, right? but things have changed. So in Act 1, when Jesus is, after he's risen, they ask him a similar question as they did earlier on. So they come together and they want to know, just like they did in Mark 13, Lord, when are you going to do this? When, when is it going to happen? When's the, when's the restoration of all things? So, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus' his answer is a little different than before. Oh, this yes. Answer question clearly, but we can note the differences. It is not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power, and then he tells them there'll be witnesses. Notice he doesn't say anything about himself knowing, or the angels for that matter. There's not, no statement about whether the angels know or not, nor does he say only the, fathers know, only the Father knows. Here, he just says the Father has fixed it by his own authority. The date's been chosen, and the Father has chosen it, and it's not for you to know. Okay, that this is just an argument from silence, perhaps, but I'll just say this. It's interesting. It's interesting that here it's different. Um, so the third piece in the puzzle would be Revelation. I won't go to Revelation. Um, oh, I forgot to put it on the screen again. Sorry. I won't go to Revelation. Right oh, I, I have my stock. I have my stack locked. Um, fuck, fuck, it's, fuck. It's a revelation that... The Father gave to... Oh, I will go to Revelation. Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. Let's just look at how it's written here. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. So the, Thank you. The I actually wanted the that. Information, the <laughs> data, the prophecy, Sweet. the future knowledge that's in Revelation is something that the Father gave to, to Jesus to show to John. Now, it's understandable why he would give it to him if you understand like the the, the self-limiting knowledge but there's some hint in revelation that god the father 
Ah, oh, you dick. Or, I, I, I would look at it that way. Give that yes. in, initiative to open up the knowledge of the end times. So Revelation has a subtle argument here that Jesus knows at least more about the day and the hour than he did when he was walking the earth. Oh, like, we're card block. Him. He's card and blocking him now. Revelation. So I admit this is I could I could easily be wrong here. I think that if I have to guess, I'm going to guess based upon the best mm. available information. And the best available information I have suggests to me Jesus does know the day and the hour right now. Now, think about how this impacts your view of Jesus. He was really human. And he he, if, if this is right, if I'm understanding scripture right, he wasn't constantly accessing omniscience, nor power. He was like really living a human life. We also read in scripture that he was tempted in every way like me and you. He felt your weakness and your futility, your, your powerlessness. We all know what it feels like to be powerless, to be like, I can't do that i don't have the ability to fix that and there was all sorts of things that jesus would have had to feel this about i think it was self-limited but it was it was causing him to have our experience he had the human experience i mean just think from from the time of his birth until he's 30 it appears jesus did no miracles he had conversations in the temple at 12 and that's it when, when he does do miracles, his own family doesn't believe him. This means that they, his own family, his, his brothers and sisters, they thought he's not a miracle worker because he lived with human weakness for 30 years. Limitations and weaknesses that he suffered alongside you and me. And when you realize how much he's identified with us, how he took on our form and took on our lives. When, when he's in the garden of Gethsemane and we read right before his crucifixion that he was so stressed out, so full of anxiety and just grief that he's hit the capillaries in his blood vessels are, br are breaking because of the stress and he's sweating blood watch and that is a All real right. medical condition now. All it, it makes me just say wow Jesus you really went through this for me you are God almighty and you took on my form my weaknesses and you really bore those things and it creates appreciation in my heart for when I see Jesus going through things I think it's really powerful. Really powerful. Okay, now I, more issues. This is a prophetic question I'm going to ask now as we're going through this passage, right? Um, what does day or hour mean? What does Jesus mean by day or hour? And the reason I'm bringing this up is because there are some who have, and I already talked about this previously, face. and I don't want to harp. Uh, it's not really my goal here. But but I want to, I mean, this is, this is the scripture at hand. Let's ask the question. When Jesus says no one knows the day or hour, does he mean, per, for those who want to be, predicting the future, trying to predict what's going to happen next. You know, always looking at current events and trying to predict the future. Um, again, I'm not completely opposed to this. I think it can be done responsibly, but I rarely see that happen, if ever. I mean, do we ever see that happen? I don't know. Um, but when he says no one knows the day or the hour, does he perhaps mean you don't know the calendar date and the time of day, which means you could still guess at the month, the season, the year, the decade? Can you still guess at those things? Can you maybe figure those things out? Can you add together what the scripture says and figure, okay, um, you know, beginning of the tribulation, here's the midway point, here's the end, here's my calendar, these are the years, these are the dates. Is that what that means? Because that's how I think Pastor Chuck Smith had taken this passage, that based on me reading between the lines as I look at his work, because he says I'm not giving a date, and then he says 1981. So. So yeah, that seems like he was viewing it that way. No. That what it means? Um, so I decided to study this topic, and I'll say this. For oh, almost you every time what? Says day or hour? I thought we were gonna choke him out. Why would you have done that? You just ruined a perfectly good choke that we had on him. Fine then, I'll take North America.
hour when they appear together in a verse in the New Testament, it's like a literal day and a literal hour. It is literal. It just really means like calendar day, time of day. Um, but that being granted, I'm going to argue now that that's not what Jesus means in this passage. And there's several specific reasons that will help build the case. So hear me out on this. Mark 13, 32, Jesus, first point, Jesus does not say the day. He says that day or hour. Um, now, that might not seem significant to you, but the phrase that day, that hour, the the way it's constructed is the only time it occurs in in the synoptics, in, in the Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's the only time that that phrase occurs. It has Old Testament connotations about prophetically a day of the Lord. And if you've ever done a study on the day of the Lord, that is a whole time season. It could be really long. It could be really short. It's not. It's a very generic term. It could mean a wide period of time. So it's not just the day or hour, it's that day. And that is significant when you look at the Old Testament and its use of the same term. And that does create the backdrop for understanding Mark. Um, in Mark 13, 33, Jesus, not only does he say, you don't know the day or the hour, but he also says they do not know when the appointed time will come. Now he just adds the phrase, the time. You don't know when the time will come. Now that's generic for sure. Even if you think day and hour are very literal, time is a very generic sense and that's how it's used. And I'll give you some examples here. And again, I'm just trying to say this is why you shouldn't predict the month or the year or the decade. Like, just give it up. <laughs> just stop. Um, as a premillennial, and I could be wrong. Maybe, maybe, maybe the postmillennials are correct. Maybe the amillennials are right. Like, if you're a premillennial like me, I'm saying even on our side, you shouldn't be predicting the day and the hour or the season or the month. Um, the time of the time is fulfilled, right? Jesus says, "The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel." What's fulfilled the time? And then Jesus here refers to the entire time of his entire three year plus ministry and the continued time going after that when the gospel's going out and going out and going out. He's referring to the time to respond to this new information about Jesus. So he's referring to a very large period of time. He uses the phrase the time in a very wide generic sense. This happens again in other places. Um, in Mark 10, 30, it represents the present age. I don't get that the move. Time, the phrase the time represents all the time between Jesus and now, right? and the final uh, kingdom when it comes. In Mark eleven thirteen, it refers to a time of year, like the season for figs. In Mark twelve, does 12, he want all of this? Of time, again, a time of year, like the season for figs. Jesus in Mark, in Mark thirteen, the fuck was that? He used it very generically you don't know when the appointed time will be my point in case i lost anyone is i'm saying you don't know the day or hour which could actually be generic because of the phrase that day or hour you also don't know the time when it will come which could this refer guy to really sucks so you shouldn't be guessing the month either well i know it'll happen during this feast of israel i don't go there why because feasts of israel are interesting and maybe they do correspond to the coming but but i'm told i don't know so why do i think that i know i think i'm going to just take god his word also in acts when i mentioned <sighs> this verse earlier i didn't point out what he says about the timing acts 1 6 and 7 here um where did i go acts 1 16 there it is acts 1 6 and 7 they ask when you you know is now the time and then jesus notice they ask him is now that is it at this time which was is it going to happen now? Is it going to happen today? Is it going to happen soon? And I don't get why you didn't want that choke where one is up here, one is up here, and then we could have just choked him out. Because now we're doing that. Now, but just not as good of a choke on him. Like, if he was a good player, he'd be able to get out. <laughs> and he says it's not for them to know the times or epochs this is a, a good <sighs> verse for this okay you are not to know the times or the epochs another term you could put there is seasons but it's pluralized <sighs> seasons plural times plural and used in a very generic sense this is clearly very general language so if you think 
Well, I don't know the day or the hour, but I know the month and I know the year. I don't think that's consistent with Acts 1, verse 7, where Jesus says, it's not given to you to know the times and the epochs. Now, your response might be, yeah, but we figured it out. We've read the writings. No, 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 guys. You're reading the writings of the guys to whom it was not given to know. How do I know what they didn't know in their own writings? They didn't know. It wasn't for them. It's not, it's not for them. If it's not for the apostles, how is it for me? It's just not for me. It's just not for me. So let me put this together, what we've looked at a few things here. Um, we don't know the day and the hour, but it's that day, which could be generic. We don't know the time. That's in Mark 13. We don't know the times and the seasons, pluralized. In other words, you just don't know. So stop. This is, this is, <laughs> this is my emphasis. Christians, those of you who get excited about predicting the future, you're off the reservation when it comes to understanding fulfilled prophecy. I think you're off the reservation. You, <clears throat> If you look at your own track record of how much you've been wrong, or perhaps the, the last few generations, just go to a study on books from the 70s where they were predicting what they, how they thought Scripture was being fulfilled and learn some humility in this. Please, please, for all of our sakes, right? because it's, it's embarrassing. And it does cause some people to fall away because they can't tell the difference between your predictions and what Scripture actually says. And when your prediction why would you open pass, them up like that then they get discouraged because they think that reflects on scripture but that was just you and I, i've heard uh, recently there was a pastor on youtube and i haven't checked into this but someone told me so let's say hypothetically there's a pastor on youtube suggesting you know he's doing studies on how the covid 19 vaccine could be leading to the mark of the beast can i just be on record guys i think this is reckless 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 it's a how? bad idea this is creating paranoia like I could do studies all day long about things that could become the mark of the beast, and I'll just make you paranoid about living in the world. We just have to stop. We just, you have to stop. Stop. <laughs> Please. And if you're listening to people and they sound very convincing, if you respect me, I would just encourage you this. At least take it with a grain of salt. Please. Jesus says no one knows. How does that pastor know? Or is it just fun for him to guess? Well, it, that fun is has a cost. It has a cost. Yeah, he says no one knows the day that he will come. He doesn't say... He doesn't say that no one knows the signs of him coming. He said to look all around and you'll see the signs of him coming. He just said no one knew the days, the day that it would happen. I'm sitting here looking at this and my mind just goes, should I kill Red? But I don't think I should yet. Because I don't think I have a good, It's I'm set up good enough to kill Red. But, like if you look at this, If you look at this, he's so sunken in that I just have to go boom, 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 boom. And then he can't get out. And I'm afraid that Red's gonna... No! That's not how that works. Okay. If you do that, I'll take this. Okay? All right, he's cool with that. Does he go boom, boom?
past. Now, let me reinforce all this. I can make it even more clear by looking at the application Jesus has for us. So in Mark 13, Jesus gives us the following application. Verse 33, he says, take heed, keep on the alert, mm. for you do not know the appointed uh, when the appointed time will come. It's like a man away on a journey who upon leaving his house and putting his slaves in charge, assigning to each one his task. This is us, guys. We have tasks to do. Also commanded the doorkeeper to stay on the alert. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming. Do you catch the, there's a cause and effect here. Jesus says, you don't know. And the, re the, the reason why I don't want you to know is so you'll be on the alert. You don't know, so you'll be on the alert. But prophecy hobbyists, they sometimes, they, and now there's nothing wrong with, you know, I love Oops. prophecy, digging into prophecy. That's not the problem here. Predicting, people who are addicted to predicting. The prediction addiction, okay, <laughs> let's just call that. The prediction addiction people, um, what they want to think is that because we know it's coming you know, around the corner next year, five years, we know that now we can have alertness. We're going to be on alert because we do know. Jesus is saying the opposite. You're going to be on the alert Oops. because you don't know. Let that, let that bomb drop into the prediction addiction environments. You'll be on the alert because you don't know. Jesus is giving a word, this is important, that's meant for every generation to be on the alert. The only way to keep every generation on the alert when you have a long di future distant second coming is to just not tell any of them because he knows that we're irresponsible. We need to get focused and stay focused on Jesus. And if you knew that he wasn't coming for a thousand years, like if you were alive in 1000 AD and fervor is going on, they're like, it's been a thousand years since Christ came. He's going to come back because because God will do. He likes math. He'll do a thousand years for sure. And if you were thinking that, and someone came to you and said, actually, it's going to be another thousand years at least before he returns. You might get discouraged and become lazy and start living for this world. Jesus wants you to be alert and awake. He, he just knows that if we know how long the wait is. We'll I am afraid with what my position is that the first person that he's going to slam is me. The reality is you really only wait one lifetime and you need to live that life for Jesus Christ. Not knowing yes. is what keeps us on guard. Pro pr prediction addiction people. <laughs> Copyright Michael in your trademark. No. Uh, prediction addiction people, they think that knowing keeps you on alert. And that's the flaw that I see um, and have seen many times. So Jesus, his attitude then is, um, you know, you need to be watching, you need to be waiting, you have tasks, you're like the, the master, he's coming to the house, I should read the rest of these verses, and I'll comment on them. Um, you don't know when the master's coming, whether in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows or in the morning, in case he should come suddenly and find you asleep, what I say to you, I say to all, be on the alert. So not knowing makes me alert, that's the application, that's what I'm supposed to do, and the uh, parable here, it is a parable here. There's a master coming. You're the servants or the slaves, depending on your translation here. And you're the ones who are given tasks. Mm, you have jo a job to do. This is. Now, here's where I want to comment on this. This is like a real practical Christian living thing, but it's something that I've, it took me a long time. This to is a real this. pickle we got um, ourselves here. And scripture teaches it. It's not like it was. And in the Bible there, it just took me, sometimes we see it in the Bible, but it still takes us a long time to sort of like, I was. This is, oh, I do not know exactly what I should do here. I do, I am out generating. Ooh. Weird. Weird placement.
This is why I'm never playing Risk again. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, did you see this? The AI. Uh... Trying to solve the murders of three young girls in 1973. We're now actively trying to find They tried the to impeach I, my Arcas. Knows the, case. the Secretary of Homeland Security has blatantly ignored the laws of the United States he is charged to faithfully execute. He has done so with reckless abandon. He has done so in a way that has led directly to the death of American citizens. 75,000 Americans dead from fentanyl poisonings last year. These numbers are oh off God, the charts at levels we've never seen before, and they are the direct result of the policies enacted by the Biden administration, but very specifically by the Secretary of Homeland Security. Mr. Speaker, impeachment is one of the most solemn, serious, somber things that we can do in this body. It's not something that ought to get thrown around lightly or invoked when you disagree with someone or you don't like their policies, or you don't, or you think they're doing a bad job. It's something that should happen after a grave what are the constitutional bots? offense has been committed. A crime against the Republic. Automated. On this vote, the yeas are two for- I think he's gonna bot out. Uh-oh. Okay, he bought it out. I don't know. 14. Wait, let me see if he bought it out. Yes, he bought it out. I don't know. If Red has realized that he bought it out. All right, Red hasn't realized that he bought it out. The thing is, is maybe he did the fake bought out strat. Ooh, shit. I think he does know that he bought it out. Hopefully it doesn't hit my 50. Hopefully it doesn't hit my 50. Please do not hit my 50. Ooh, she, oh, Nelly. Okay. It's my turn. We got like this. Boom. Let's see if he just opens me up to getting smacked. No, he does not.
Wait, ooh. Beautiful. I got to Oh, he's gonna, that's going to hit my bonus, so. Are they back? Oh, they're back. It's not a bot anymore. That person's using the scumbag bot out strategy, the where you try to bot out and wait for. Us to kill each other. Now, let's give him a heart.
Ah. Okay. Yeah, nah. Ha. Yeah, this guy is waiting. I wonder if there is a uh, collaborating, hacking, cheating, harassment, stalling, offensive name. No. It's like if there is a for the bot out strategy. I ah, saw flying again. Do I think that I could kill Red? <sighs> Fuck, no. I don't think I could blow through that and then kill Red.
Okay, so here's the plan. We go like this, boom. Right here, next phase, boom. End attack phase, boom. Right there, boom. Then we see what happens. I think that I can kill Red with that line. And then break all of purple shit. Ah, that motherfucker. Trying to block me from fucking getting a red kill. At least I could go boom, 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 boom. Boom, boom, boom. There we go. That actually opened it up fairly well. Let's see. Hopefully he... Fuck! Piece of shit, bro. Just bought out. I'm gonna be pit... I mean, he does seem like he's just botting out, so. Or is he really dumb? Fuck you. Fuck this guy. Fuck you. You're a piece of shit, you know that? Playing like that is just such a scumbag way to play. Fucking what a cunt.
Yeah, he was a beginner. Mm. How can you be a beginner and know that strategy? Unless if you really suck at the game. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> What is he talking about? This is just a pro hate crime bill. I'm gonna play one more game of Risk. Oh, that's cool. Georgia has introduced HB 1128 called the Women's Bill of Rights. Uh, two guesses as to what this one refers to. It is not about women's rights. Most alarmingly, it ends all legal recognition of trans people and re based <laughs> removes sexual orientation and gender identity from qualifying as a hate crime. Nice. Based it sex, you see. So um, it's I just the, think uh, that we need to get rid crime, of. I think that we just need to get rid of hate crimes. Honestly, they make no fucking sense. Like you committed a crime. What does it matter why you committed the crime? The bill would prevent people from updating their legal gender markers on driver's licenses, birth certificates, medical documents, and so much more. It would ban trans people from bathrooms and more. Based. Where's the full text? This Every just sounds state sweet. Has their own goddamn. Last month, I saw Clockwork Orange on the big screen, and my god, this movie is so freaking good. It is really good. If you haven't seen Clockwork Orange, you definitely should go watch it. Goodness is chosen. An exploration of the interplay between choice and morality, the film posits that stripping people of the capacity for evil doesn't cultivate moral beings so much as it... One sec. I need to go to the bathroom real quick. Oh, right when the... Right when there's people coming in. Yeah. If it doesn't, it just makes them come out. No, do not add bot. Fuck you for even suggesting it, you dumb bitch. Just start the game rather than adding a bot. It erases humanity. He ceases to be a robot. Ah. He ceases also to be a creature. Wow, that was so perfectly timed but for me. One of the most precious qualities of timeless art is its capacity to reveal new layers of meaning at different stages in life. With this viewing, I found myself contemplating a more nuanced aspect of this Kubrick masterwork, one that resonates with a lot of the discussions we've been having lately on the channel and on the Discord. I realize that the film goes beyond simply condemning the type of conditioning depicted in the Ludovico technique. The movie itself is an example of such ideological conditioning. 
Let's dive in. If you haven't seen the film recently, A Clockwork Orange follows Alex DeLarge, a charismatic sociopath with a penchant for classical music and ultraviolence. After a series of heinous assaults, Alex is arrested and chosen for an experimental rehabilitation program called the Ludovico Technique. The treatment conditions him to associate violent thoughts with extreme feelings of nausea, effectively robbing him of the ability to commit aggressive acts, even in self-defense. People who Alex had previously wronged exploit his All right, what is the play here? Politically inconvenient for the ruling party responsible for the Ludovico. It looks like I go for uh... restoring Alex's freedom. The end. Cinema is full of stories that conclude triumphantly by portraying bad guys losing their freedom in the form of incarceration or being stripped of their powers. So that feeling of exhilaration we feel when Alex regains his capacity for violence can't be solely attributed to a belief in universal freedom. Sure, there's a difference between limiting someone's environment and limiting someone's will, but I think there's something else at play that explains our curious reaction to Alex's cure. Truth ah, is, you do. Alex's liberation at the end because simply, he's likable. One of the reasons the film and Malcolm McDowell's performance is so legendary is because, well, it's not easy to convince an audience to identify with a deranged psycho. Yet Alex undeniably possess. I don't know. There's a lot of movies that make people identify with deranged psychos. Like every single one of the literally me movies, all of them you're identifying with like a. Like a crazy person. Almost every single one of them, I would say. Yeah. Tick it down. Make alliance request. This is a stylish allure. There's a captivating charisma in Alex's demeanor, a certain flair to okay, his speech, you dumb fuck. and a confident bravado to his movements. What A Clockwork Orange reveals is the extent to which we are all subject to be conditioned by aesthetics, or artistry, beauty, swagger, and fashion. That which stimulates us and resonates on a primal level. Art is all over this film, drawing our attention to the aesthetic realm. The camera often lingers on elevated, ornate, high culture artistry. The Catwoman's house is full of, quote, important pieces of art. It's a very important work of art. Paintings adorn the corridors of Alex's hangout spots. Defaced classic art is plastered mm -hmm. in the lobby of Alex's flat. And the overall production design is futuristic and eccentric, with everything from clothes to furniture to milk dispensers designed. In yeah, I was just about to mention this shit. This shit's real fucking weird away far removed from their practical function. Whereas the Ludovico scientists employ aesthetic forms like film and music to condition Alex against violence, the movie A Clockwork Orange does the opposite. It builds a character with such panache and style that we're conditioned to sympathize with a violent sociopath. Instead of a serum does he hit that for at the site of horrific violence, Kubrick serves us a different intoxicant, the cinematic form. Close-ups plunge us into Alex's subjectivity. Exotic, idiosyncratic voiceovers enmesh his thoughts with our own. A nice, warm, vibratory feeling all through your gutty words. Production design, makeup, costuming, and choreography command our attention and tantalize our senses. The movie's emphasis on art isn't just arbitrary flair. It reflects how artful expression can turn brutality into a seductive performance and how with just a little bit of style, we can be convinced to accept anything. In this sense, A Clockwork Orange is a meditation on how aesthetics, and more specifically cultural symbols like paintings, music, and films, can be manipulated for ideological purposes. The film highlights the intricate relationship between aesthetics and belief, revealing that Come art on, is one of the most crucial and powerful tools in strengthening Manitab. ideological commitments. This is why Plato famously proposed that poets should be banned from his ideal republic. 
He feared that poetry could depict immoral behavior in such tantalizing ways that it could corrupt the minds of the young and perpetuate unethical acts. He recognized the aesthetic realm's profound ability to direct people's passions, so he mused that art should only be able to depict upstanding values. Kubrick, however, by juxtaposing extreme violence and, quote, high culture classical music, seems to suggest that elevated culture doesn't necessarily yield elevated morals, but why doesn't it? I mean, there's little doubt that Plato would approve of Alex's greatest passion, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, a piece that famously celebrates the universal dignity and brotherhood of mankind. Plato wouldn't be too happy to know that even art that promotes virtuous values can stimulate violent fantasies in a guy who gets off on that kind of thing. So what did Plato get wrong? Well, maybe it's not that he got it wrong so much as it is that things have changed. In his work, Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, philosopher Walter Benjamin talks about how the advent of new technologies for reproducing art, such as photography and film, or in the case of A Clockwork Orange, proto mini cassettes led to a shift in the way art was experienced and consumed which brought with it significant ramifications for the ideological and political spheres the mechanical reproduction of art eroded what he termed the aura surrounding traditional artworks which were tied to specific cultural and religious contexts for example, imagine the only way you could experience the breathtaking Notre Dame Cathedral was to visit the building and attend a sermon. Back then, the architectural beauty, inseparable from its religious setting, maintained an aura that reinforced the intended ideological framework of Christianity. Now imagine it's 2024 and you get a Notre Dame postcard from your friend Bob. This rendering of the cathedral carries neither the weight nor the significance of seeing it in its original context. Chances are the religious associations won't factor at all in the way you interact with it. You'll probably just say, oh, cool, Bob is in France and he thought of us, how nice. The ability of the art to be mass-produced erodes its cultural and religious foundations. On the one hand, Benjamin was excited about the potential to erode the auras associated with works of art, as it opened an opportunity to divorce art from what he considered to be a parasitic dependence on bourgeois ritual. However, there was also a downside to the diminishing aura, as the ability to establish new ones or false auras could transform art into a potent tool for political manipulation. Mechanical reproduction of media facilitated what he called the aestheticization of politics, where political movements could exploit the captivating allure of images to advance their agendas. In the 20th century, fascist regimes were able to harness the power of mass media and visual imagery to create a cult of personality around their leaders, glorify their ideologies, and quell dissent. Alex's obsession with Beethoven's Ninth illustrates how, in a modern, or in the case of the movie, futuristic context, art has the capacity to be repurposed for radically diverging ends. Oh, crudely, you piece of shit. It's a lot harder to oh, what is he doing? fantasies about violence while listening to Beethoven if you can only hear it at a the concert fuck was that? the whole symphony orchestra. But with the ability to pop it into the mini proto cassette player or whatever the transcendent beauty of beethoven can be integrated into many more contexts and thus redirected to many more purposes the fuck purposes that plato would definitely not approve of in his feature-length video essay the pervert's guide to ideology my favorite philosopher who i always talk about slavoj Zizek, Slavo wait what is this claims that there's something unique The Pervert's Guide to Philosophy. Oh, Pervert's Guide to Ideology. Okay. Uh, options. It's only on Apple TV, the one that I don't have. Fucking gay. I kind of wanted to watch that. Because even though I don't really like Sla like I don't agree with Slavoj Zizek, I do sometimes like him. Like, I don't mind his...
about the universal adaptability of Beethoven's Ninth. In a discussion about A Clockwork Orange and Beethoven, Zizek mentions how the Ode to Joy has been used by political parties whose messages are directly opposed to each other. It was considered an official song by the Nazi party to celebrate huh. great achievements. The Soviet Union claimed Ode to Joy as a communist song. It was even accepted and promoted in China during the Cultural Revolution. On the far right, it was the anthem of South Rhodesia, which was a country created just so it didn't have to abolish apartheid. While on the far left, it was adored by the leader of the Peruvian guerrilla faction, the Shining Path. Now, to be clear, Zizek is making a different and much more complex point here. In Zizek's analysis, Alex represents the elements of society that makes ideological fantasies necessary. Part of his theory of ideology is the notion that every social order harbors inherent antagonisms or contradictions that cannot be integrated into the official ideology. For example, let's take a simple ideological construct that everyone understands, the American dream, with the idea that anyone can attain success and prosperity through hard work regardless of their background or circumstances. However, the reality is there's a significant gap between this idea and the social reality. Attack that, that floor, do it. Despite you the won't. Of equal opportunity, there are systemic barriers that make it really hard for some to achieve this dream, such as class disparities, racial discrimination, educational access, housing affordability, clean water issues, etc. Zizek calls this contradiction of the official ideology a symptom. This gap between the official ideology and the Bro, is this a bot? constantly obscured no. or denied through the person just really, really, really as, sucks. In this case, the perpetuation of the myth of existing perfect meritocracy or lionizing personal responsibility. Both things I generally support, but in the case of meritocracy, the notion that the economic system that currently exists is entirely built around it is, well, a fantasy. Another famous example Zizek references is the scapegoating of Jews during World War II. German society was a wreck. That's the symptom, and in order to maintain the appearance of ideological coherence, they had to create a scapegoat, or the ideological fantasy that all problems can be blamed on Jews. In Zizek's analysis, if the beginning of the final movement of Beethoven's Ninth I mean, can't they? is the official ideology, you know, the part that everybody knows that preaches universal humanity and dignity. <sighs> then Come on, hit that four. Second part, when the sentimental celebration stops and we transition to something much more playful and subversive. Hit that four. This is the part of the Do song it. playing in the scene you where Alex won't. is perusing the record store, feeling very in his element. This more subversive part of the piece uh, is if associated If he hits that four, I'm going to be so happy. Ah, you cunt.
<sighs> hopefully, Red doesn't have a. Uh, all right, hopefully. Antagonism in society that the official ideology Yellow of universal have... brotherhood cannot acknowledge. In this case, the obvious fact that there are some people who cannot be included in this universal brotherhood of man. That there are exceptions. Zizek claims that Beethoven was super ahead of his time, and by seducing us with swelling feelings of brotherly love and then undercutting it, he was critiquing ideology, essentially pointing out how these sentimental claims to universal beauty ought not be taken too seriously, as they are very likely masking a failure of the social order. Anyway, back to aesthetics. Sorry, I get stuck on Zizek sometimes. The point is, art is one of the most powerful tools in consolidating ideological loyalties, and in a time where art can be completely alienated from its original context and redirected to other ends, humanity has perhaps never been more susceptible to ideological manipulation. And A Clockwork Orange is a perfect example. Ah, of I was really hoping that he didn't have a trade. Side, but instead of a... Bro, why is he not taking the... He is not well... I just saw him hit... A fucking... I just saw him Zero hit making us feel disgusted by disturbing like a 10. We are subjected so to why does he not want to hit a three? A master and the artistry of one of history's greatest musicians compelling us to root for a violent sociopath. Kubrick's point isn't just that morality needs choice, but also that morality can take a back seat to the aesthetic. If a war is properly glorious, it's justified. If a political party's branding is sufficiently compelling, it can be painted as righteous. After all, at the end of the movie, what exactly are we celebrating when he's cured? Are we rejoicing in an automaton regaining his humanity because he can choose again? Or is it darker than that? Are we celebrating an artist getting his paintbrush back? During that last moment when Beethoven's Ninth plays over Alex doing something wild, Kubrick proves the point that a song about the universal dignity of man can be used to celebrate the return of the sociopath. I was cured, all right. Hey y'all, thanks for watching. If you enjoy the content and want to support the channel, don't forget to check out my coffee page where you can sign up for monthly donations or do one-off donations. Don't forget to hit me up on Twitch, follow me on Letterboxd, join the Discord, all them links are below. Also, after two and a half years, I'm finally visiting my friends and family back in the States, so I'll be taking a break from streaming for about a month. But that just means I'll be back around the time the new South Park game comes out, which I'm super stoked about. So... Yeah, I'm definitely going to play the new South Park game when I on stream. I'll see y'all in the spring, and as always, thanks for watching, guys. Peace. Is AI making us less human? I don't know, is it? I can't tell what he's trying to do here. <sighs> I was like, you break me, you get fucked up, bro.
the NPC TikTok stream explained. I actually do want to know what this guy has to think. <laughs> Bro, that shit's so fucking weird. You know what else I saw on TikTok? This ketchup. I. Uh, the ketchup challenge or whatever. We'll talk about that after this game. The ketchup challenge is such... If you ever... If your girlfriend ever does that to you, the ketchup challenge or whatever the fuck it's called, break up with her immediately. Come on, don't have a trade. Yes! I kill... Yellow... Next turn. I initially wanted to put this topic into a TikTok Tuesday, but I realized pretty quickly there's something else going on here. So let's get right into it. Have you ever heard of the NPC meme? Well, yeah, you probably have. It's an old meme at this point. The gray NPC Wojak? I think I did something on it way back in the day with Scrump. But I don't mean that. I mean the NPC TikTok meme. Well, there is a girl whose entire thing is acting like a Bethesda NPC, like from Fallout or Skyrim or something. These are actually some really funny TikToks. She's been doing this gimmick for a couple years now. She really has the animations down pat, from the walking to the hand movements. To anybody who's played Fallout 3 back in the day, this is uncanny and really funny. But no, we're not talking about her today either, Dev, you silly bitch. Today there is a new type of NPC TikTok, and I'm just gonna let one clip play for you in its entirety before we get started, because it will blow your fucking mind. Behold! Mm, marshmallow. Crunchy corn, yum! Oh, I've never seen this one. I only saw one... There was one person who I saw who was doing it. It was like a black chick, though. Kitty paws. Bro, how do they get to- how are they able to do this shit? Like, what the fuck? How are they able to move like that? You know that there's dudes who are jerking off to this shit, right? Like, that's what- that's what these dudes are doing. They're jer that's what people are doing. They're jerking off to this. Did you feel it? Did you feel your brain rewire itself watching that shit? There's a lot of clips of this girl doing NPC streams like this, and to be honest, that's not too surprising. This is Cherry Crush, and a lot of Zoomers probably know her for her massively popular ASMR channel. But if you were watching porn back in 2012, you're more likely to know her for her massively prolific amateur- What the fuck? Why did this guy say good game? Is he just gonna slam into me?
There we go. Yeah, he went. Fuck. Why would he pick red over me? Why would he pick me over red to kill first? Fuck you. Fucking A. That pissed me off. It's her porn career. She got her start doing pretty much everything. Facials, threesomes, taking it in the ass, and she- What the fuck? Why you say it like that? She tried to look like an anime character while doing it, with really expensive wigs and costumes. Wait, so that wasn't Belle Delphine? Less the costumes, though, since she was generally naked. Whether it's porn or ASMR or now this NPC streaming thing, Cherry Crush has consistently been on the edge of the next big thing for attracting simps for over a decade. So, what is the NPC stream? Like with most weird internet stuff, it started in Japan. The Japanese TikToker Natue Koko, I think, she would dress up in an elaborate costume and make Yeah, bro, why does Japan make such weird fucking shit? NPC idol animation. You know, like if there were a character in a video game <laughs> just standing there and you were talking to him, she would shift slightly or bob up and down or whatever. If she received a donation, she would react to it. With other streamers, if there's a dono, a text-to-speech bot reads the caption out, or maybe music is played, or they have some of their effects rigged up, or there's a question the streamer has to answer. But for Natuya Coco, she had a set of pre-practiced responses to each possible donation type, like an NPC in a video game would react. Watching the performance, it's truly uncanny. It's a real person, but she's fully and believably behaving like an NPC. Of course, it crossed over to the English-speaking world, leading to a bunch of e-thoughts like Cherry Crush jumping on the trend. The other big name going viral for this kind of stuff right now is Pinky Doll, who has a similar. That's the uh, one that I seen. That's the one that I seen on. Genre history as Cherry Crush. If you didn't come across this trend on Twitter by seeing the last clip I played, then it was certainly because of this clip. Grab, 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 grab balloon. Grab. Mmm, ice cream so good. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, thank you, VC. You got me feeling like a queen, huh? Thank you, Shelby. Fire, fire, This just fire, makes me fire, uncomfortable. Fire. Ooh, gang, 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 gang. How are dudes jerking off to this? So you might have noticed that she's holding a single unpopped popcorn kernel in between the tongs of a hair straightener. Once the straightener heats up enough that the kernel pops, she puts it aside and then grabs another kernel. Yes, while she's reacting to the donations, she is also manually popping popcorn, one kernel at a time. Why? Is that part of the donation thing? Is this somebody's fetish? Is it just to gauge how long she's been going? We may never know. Having watched a ton of this garbage for this video, I came across one clip where Pinky Doll broke character live to discipline her child. Balloon. Now, yes, this is in French, but even though I'm Canadian, I still can't speak French because it's a worthless dead language. But it's pretty clear what's going on. She's telling her kid to go. Bro, down. what is up with this person?
Oh, I don't even know what the fuck to do right now. After that, whatever that was. Fucking A, bro. Red really fucked me. Because mom is busy at work, and she counts down from five before she's gonna get up and whoop his ass over it. It was surreal to watch the character break. She actually became a real person again for a minute. It felt like snapping out of a fever dream. So, here's how they make money. You can buy TikTok coins, which work exactly like Twitch bits or DLive lemons back when DLive was relevant. You pay real money to get coins. You donate the coins to streamers. Streamers then convert the coins back into oh, real money. Oh, good. It's in the conversion rate that the platform takes their cut. The streamer always gets less real money out of the coins than the viewer puts into them. Looking at the donation guide of the streamers, you can see that an ice cream cone costs one coin, as does a GG or a, a, a gang gang. A How much does a coin cost? It costs 30 coins. A hat and mustache cost 99 coins, and so on. The NPC streamer has a pre-rehearsed response to each of these purchases, so that she can authentically act like an NPC who has been given one of these gifts in a video game. In fact, it feels almost like a Tamagotchi, a virtual pet for those of you who weren't around in the 90s. I'm sure that there's Flash games or whatever that you played if you're younger than me. In a game, when you give a virtual pet a gift from a limited selection of gifts, they tend to have identical reactions each time, unless they're full or something. And trust me, these e-thoughts are never full. They'll always take your money. It's actually pretty sneaky how these setups work. Here's the pricing scale for TikTok coins. But again, DLive Lemons and Twitch Bits are similar. 100 coins costs not $1 or 100 pennies. That's too easy. That would mean your average Joe would actually be capable of roughly keeping track in their head how much they've spent on these girls. No, 100 coins is $1.29. The other coin bundles are also random weird amounts. And these bundles change Thanks. regularly and are also different across different currencies. So you can never really know how much you're spending. Also, wait a second, the smaller bundle is actually cheaper than the larger bundle. Yeah, for 10,000 coins, it's $134.99. At that price, one coin costs you 1.3499 cents. But the 100 coin bundle is 129. At that price, one coin is 1.29 cents. The point of larger bundles is supposed to be that as they scale up, you get a greater discount for buying in bulk. But I guess TikTok is fucking people here too. As is the trajectory for every single e-thought trend, eventually you get a bunch of girls piling One on. Second. They notice what's happening. They notice the immense payday these chicks are pulling in. And they think, hey, I can do that too. But just like with OnlyFans and with Twitch and with ASMR, most of them can't do it too. As off-putting as this whole trend is, there is a level of quality to it when you compare the high earners, the outfits and the makeup, the acting, they you know what they're doing, to the copycats. <sighs> For me, for me, for me, for me, for me, for me, I'm taco, for me, for me, I'm hot dog, hot, 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 what the fuck? Hot, hot. Yeah, there's something off with them, isn't there? There's far less production value to the whole thing. They're generally just sitting on their bed or in their gamer chair, looking how they'd normally look, doing a poor approximation of what an NPC sounds like. They sound, and I can't believe I'm saying this as a negative, too <sighs> lifelike. You can scroll through TikTok Live right now and see channels all over the place doing this sort of thing. And each new iteration is less impressive. And then you get to the real bottom of the barrel, where you have dudes doing this shit. <laughs> I love you, you love me too. Mm, Rhyme me like a cowboy, Rhyme me like a cowboy. Is this... What's his... Kai? This is probably him just joking, though. Rhyme me like a cowboy. Mm. Oh, disco. Ooh, dance. Mm. Oh, you see my bed? Oh, I'm the king. You're not the king. I'm the king. You're not the king. I'm the king. Oh, you love me. I love you. Mm. You love me. I love you. Mm. Roses. Mm. 100,000 people. Ain't no fucking way. Mm. Roses. Who the hell is donating to these random guys who are poorly idling as NPCs on TikTok? Look at this. This one guy is holding a hair straightener, but there's no corn kernel in it. He's just doing it because that's the trend and he wants to go viral. 
we're already at the point where the meme has entered into the simulacrum phase, where all of the meaning has been stripped from it, and people are simply repeating what came before. Because okay, because I think it's that red. There's a lot of people out there who are just taking the piss. Is they're doing it poorly. They're kind of confused about why they're doing it. They're joking around, having a laugh at their chat's expense, having a laugh at their own expense, and these ones are actually pretty funny. Just because taking the piss at something popular will never not be funny to my millennial ass. <laughs> what the fuck? <gasps> this <laughs> I got the soccer ball mm, ice cream. What the fuck? Is this one a joke? Cause this one doesn't seem like they're trying to be serious. I really don't know what to do right now. I got screwed. Like, completely screwed. Alright, I get a 10 set. Let's see what red does. Do they slam into anyone? Like they have been for the past like five fucking. Please slam into blue. kills mm, ice cream talk to your daddy y'all let him talk to his dad please please hey, what's going on, thank you for the glizzies listen your daddy is talking what's good pops hey what's going on dude thank you for the glizzies <laughs> no, no, no. ew what the fuck Oh, fuck you. Bro, fuck you. I deserve that fucking oh, kill. Just stop, just stop, because you oh! should be trying to get him some help. Please, just don't, don't keep entertaining. Thank you for the glizzies. Don't entertain this madness. We trying to truly help our son. Thank you for the cap off. No, listen to us. Mmm, <laughs> glizzy, yum, yummy, yes, yes. <laughs> Ew. What the fuck is this fat bitch doing? <laughs> <laughs> also, I found an Andrew Tate one. What, what the fuck is this? Top cheat, top cheat. Ooh, <laughs> another girlfriend? 
yummy. Haram. Touchy, touchy, touchy. Woo. Mitch is a dog. Else arrest. Free top G. Free top G. Look at this comment. Why am I here? Because we're all here, Greg. Because we can never leave. I wonder what these women. I've never do. seen any of them. I mean, they know what they're doing. They set it up. What I'm saying is, when she's bouncing in place and acting like this, is she asking herself, what type of person does this appeal to? Who are the ones giving me money to act like a computer program? I've watched some of these over 30 times now. There's no arousal whatsoever. Not a single extra drop of blood rushed to my penis. It was like watching animals. <laughs> Not a sleep. single I drop of blood. Extra drop of right blood mind rushed to my penis. Interesting. I used to shit on all manner of streamers and YouTubers for their low effort, low entertainment content. But I think this takes the cake. It's not that it's bad. Like I said, some of the women put a lot of work into this. But it's like, okay, it, it's like, let's say humanity encountered an alien race. And these aliens ate shiny purple globs that grew off of the sides of blue alien cactuses. These aliens probably have a complicated sense of what makes a good shiny purple glob and what makes a bad one. They have a complicated understanding of how to grow the blue alien cactuses such that the best shiny purple globs are produced. They probably have complicated social roles and rituals surrounding the whole enterprise. But to humans, who don't eat shiny purple globs, the whole thing is just alien. We can intellectually notice the difference between a good and a bad shiny Okay, this guy's a piece glob, of but shit. But we're not gonna care the way the aliens do. That's how I feel watching this stuff. I feel like I lack a fundamental part of my brain that makes me connect with whatever's happening here. Or maybe the people who like this stuff lack a fundamental part of their brain, which is why they like it in the first place. Yeah, that's probably it. The consumers of this content feel totally unknowable to me. I can't even speculate what's going on in their heads beyond extreme loneliness and very strange, very niche fetishes. But the women who make it? Are they just there for the money or do they, on some level, also enjoy this? Well, after Pinky Doll's stuff went viral, she made a video talking about people who are hating on her. Okay guys, I have a question for the people who doesn't like me. Why do you feel the need to hate me? I mean, like, people be like, oh, she got fake change, she got fake gold. Like, first of all, this is not fake. It's all real, all real. Okay, Versace, Versace, yes. I'm not even flexing because anybody can get it. If you work, you can get it, and that's it. It is what it is. So when you're wasting your time like this on me, you could have put this time that you waste on me on you and do something about your life. Become the person you always wanted to be. Uh, let me, uh, let me try and translate that. The idea basically is there's a gap in the market. Clearly there's a demand for what she's doing, or else she wouldn't be making money off of it. And she's not doing anything wrong, she's just getting paid. If there's a wider social problem here, it's not with her. It's with the people who are paying her. Their desire wouldn't go away if she disappeared. To that I say, well, maybe, maybe not. There's a complicated conversation here about how much demand creates supply, and how much supply can actually create demand. You know, it's the kind of thing where you wouldn't miss video games if you existed before video games were invented. I watched a few of her other TikToks, and she's, uh, she's just in her head. Yo, y'all need to stop coming after me, because I never say I create NPC, but I did create this entire train going viral everywhere. Yes, I did that. You need to listen. What the fuck? <laughs> to what I say, process, and understand that you talking caca. She's really happy that she's going viral despite the haters, and she thinks this is the beginning of a huge career. It might even be, who knows? But she honestly seems like an NPC herself. I also watched Sargon and Callum talk about this in the Lotus Eaters, and that was actually a pretty funny conversation. Callum said the day previous he kind of didn't want to do this because Sargon believed there was some sort of deeper meaning here, while Callum thought it was just another case of the internet being weird in that way that the internet is. Why the hell is this happening? I mean, you you seem to you seem to just know. Money. Same reason anything odd happens on the internet. Yeah, well, it's entertaining. That's literally it. Right. There's no grand theory about this. It was just. Ah, oh, weird, okay. cool thing on the internet. It'll blow over in a few months, and then we'll all forget about it. You seem completely nonplussed by this, but, but I me, not. Me and nothing about been, this is new. Me and Carl have been going over and over this one, and he wants to do a, a premium Yeah, he's podcast. making me sit through an hour tomorrow where he wants to give me a big grand theory about how this proves... Well, because there must be something going on here. I... No, there's not. It's just the internet. Calm's got a point. Bro, what? Think there's actually something underneath. Sargon made it about modernity, how this was yet another symptom in a very long list of symptoms showing the moral degradation of the modern world, and how relationships have basically been destroyed by rampant internet coomerism. There is something to that, but I want to take it in a bit of a different direction. Okay, what is this? Adam and Sitch, you know that I'm not a big fan of Mencius Moldbug. Alternatively, if you've been watching me for any length of time, you also know that I believe that every notable writer and thinker is notable for a reason. That they've all said something insightful, from Moldbug to Marx. And just because you disagree with all of their prescriptions, doesn't mean that they have no insight to offer. 
As a matter of fact, though their prescriptions are dog shit, both Marks and Moldbug have some good critiques that are worth reading. One of the metaphors Moldbug likes to use is the elf and the hobbit. He's a Tolkien nerd. Here's how he frames the conversation in his essay, You Can Only Lose the Culture War. We know who are the hobbits and who are the elves. We know who is on top and who's on the bottom. We know what the elves want. They want to live beautiful lives. We know what the hobbits want. They want to... Fuck! Bro. I think the, the red was... Okay. What the fuck is this? I am so confused. What the fuck? Just fucking hit orange. What's up, one ball? Bro, we need to work together. Why do you keep hitting me and not orange? Oh, this is pissing me off. Do some. In race kids. What do you Otherwise, we're both gonna real? lose. We basically Elves both already did fucking lose. American left wing who rent out the shoe boxes in shiny, expensive cities and live very picturesque Instagram lives, and they're very attractive people, and they sit on their high horse about how morally superior they are. The hobbits are the flyover state, country bumpkin American right wing who want to be left alone to their land and their traditions, to raise their families and do honest work, and keep their noses out of other people's private business, and not care too much about their redneck social standing. Moldbug also makes this dynamic clear about elves and hobbits. So he just accepted second place. What the fuck was that? What was that game? How was he an expert? I was willing to work with it. What the fuck? That pissed me off. I just get slammed into by some fucking noob who the whole time. What the f I'm pissed. I'm so pissed right now. That wasn't even funny. That was just bullshit. That whole game was bullshit. When elves use political power to impose elf culture on you, you cannot use political power to impose hobbit culture on elves. <laughs> if there is a way to impose hobbit culture only on hobbits, there might be a case. But our country is not configured to support separate rules for elves and hobbits. If it was, it would be a different country. Maybe a better country, but it isn't. The only way to impose hobbit culture is to impose it on everyone, including elves. 
elves do not like to be told what to do by hobbits. Even advice makes elves mad. It is outrageous. Yeah, and dude. And my elves get pissed. Hobbits coerce elves utterly unacceptable. Even if such coercion is only symbolic, it is a profound violation of elven rights. Your elf will not just be mad, he will explode, wronged in every fiber of his being. America is a political marriage of blue state elves and red state hobbits. The elves are terrified of the hobbits' pitchforks. They can only survive by ruling the hobbits with an iron hand, or at least by inundating the hobbits' brains with pro-elf propaganda, or better yet, both. Hobbits just want to be governed sensibly, in a way that makes sense to hobbits, so that they can just grill. Hobbits have little desire for power and no great talent for it, which is what makes them so easy for the elves to rule. And hobbits are not, not in their hearts, into telling elves how to live their lives. Hobbits do not need to be in charge. Hobbits do not want to rule the world, should not want to rule the world, and could not rule the world. Hobbits do not even need to be governed by hobbits. They just need to be governed as hobbits. Governing them as elves, though, generates significant irritation and is best regarded as hobbit abuse. The TLDR here is that the American left and right are not simply two political wings. They are two different ethnicities. Not in the blood sense, but in the culture sense. Go back and watch my video on indigeneity. They have a different geography, different customs and traditions and beliefs. They have a different sense of how the world around them should be. This is the main reason that so many populists right now are pushing for a national divorce. I don't know about that one personally, but I do know that Moldbug's analysis of the right and the left, that the left wants to live attractive, materially fulfilled lives, while the right wants to live local, <sighs> spiritually fulfilled lives, is, broadly speaking, accurate. Whenever something goes viral on the internet that is utterly alien to most normies, and revolting to most rightoids, like the NPC TikTok stream thing, this is a portal opening between the two worlds. This is the hobbit seeing what passes for elf culture and wondering what the actual fuck is going on over there. The height of the yeah, last fucking elves, bro. social status and materialism was always going to lead to this sort of thing. If you're a porn watcher, you know new porn is overly produced to the point that it's not even enticing anymore. Only fans... What do you mean? Wait, what? I'm confused. What does he mean by new porn is overly produced to where it's not even enticing anymore? Does anyone here know what he means by that? I guess I'm not a porn watcher then. Which I guess is a good thing. Hmm. I do not like this setup. What should I do? Whoa. These girls are looking more and more perfect, but also more fake. Attractive celebrities were always vain, but they seem even vainer now than they ever have been. Though maybe that's my age showing. However, there are more and more random e-girls who believe that they have a license to act like a vain celebrity ha! just because they're physically somewhat attractive and have a large following on TikTok. Every single influencer and TikTok. Yeah, bro. Fuck e-girls. I, I think, honestly, we should ban women from using social media. I think that would cure a lot of what's going on in the world. I think women need to quit using social media. <laughs> okay, I thought that I was... Hmm, let's see here. Let's see here. What should we do? Uh, yeah. Boom. Yeah, I was thinking I was black for some weird reason. Next phase. Uh, bo, bo, bo. Like that. Boom. End attack phase. Boom. Get this. Boom. I'm going to get out of your bonus. who put the Amalfi Coast on my For You page over the last two months deserves jail time. Because while they showed you the gorgeous coastlines and the cute little towns, what they didn't tell you were the disclaimers. First of all, it's impossible to get here. You have to fly into Naples. Then you have to take a train from Naples. Shut the fuck up. 
to Sorrento. Then you have to stand. Bro, why do women bitch so much? Is this person a bot? They're acting like a bot. That's for sure. I move that in. Okay. Well, now I can't get out. In 90 degree weather, no one really accepted my all of your luggage. Mind you, we've been in Europe for two weeks. All of your luggage, lug it on. Ah, you douche! Get to Amalfi Coast finally. Then, it, to get to the highest of the high points, the beautiful hotels with the gorgeous. This, there is no streets here, there's no cars driving. So, you have to walk up 160 stairs with all of your luggage to get to the top of this. Oh, my goodness, you have to do shit. No, your life's so terrible. You gotta go on a vacation, but you're gonna complain about the gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous area with these beautiful views. Carry it, and then also all the power went out because the Amalfi Coast doesn't have the infrastructure to support this tourism. Oh my god. And I've done many videos about how pop culture has been universalized to the point that it's nothing but an endless torrent of lifeless gray sludge. Built Please to don't nobody, slam into my five. Boring as fuck. In Moldbug's terms, we're reaching peak elf culture. The NPC I want to get out is just another iteration of freeze-dried, plastic-wrapped, devoid of any nutritional content entertainment meant to nickel and dime your savings away into the pocket of a beautiful person. For some people, this is just coomerism, and that needs no further insight. But for others, there's act. Wait, what's coomerism? Is that just like? Okay. Actually, a more insidious explanation. This is what is at the core of all parasocial relationships between beautiful e-celebs and their generally not-so-beautiful fans, independent of any sexual attraction. It's so that you can pretend, for a few seconds, that you're living a beautiful life yourself, in the elven sense. That you're a part of the elf world rather than the hobbit one. That you are a peer of what our society currently holds up as ideal. You can see this across all of the internet's popularity waves, except maybe the stuff before 2009, because back then it was really hard to make a living off of it. A good chunk of the people who followed the blowout Let's Players of the early 2010s did so not only because they were funny, but because they wanted to make it as Let's Players too. They wanted to move Which that one? Scene, not just online, but sometimes even... If you're saying this one, players. fuck no. I like haven't YouTubers, even gotten a bonus. YouTubers, Twitch politics streamers, they and their fans... If you're saying that one, yes, you can. This is why I you always may. say, if your favorite small streamer thinks that their next big career move is to move to LA to start making connections at streamer parties or whatever, pack it up, man, it's over. Stop watching them. Because they're going to turn into that gray sludge and lose everything you loved about them in the process. As for why some hobbits want to be part of the elf world in the first place, rather than valuing the hobbit way of life, it's probably for the reason that Molbug mentioned. The elves inundating the hobbits with pro-elf propaganda. Every small town has a group of kids who hated living there and couldn't wait to move away to the city and start their own life, who, now that they're adults, only have negative things to say about the place and the culture and the people of their youth. Hell, I'm someone like that. I get it. Personally, I don't like elf culture or hobbit culture, per Molbug's metaphor. Definitely more, might... I'm definitely more of a hobbit cultured type of guy. The hobbits seem based, dog. Make me a dark elf. But I also don't align with Moldbug either, so maybe it's just time to drop that frame. The point is, when you see weird internet shit like the NPC TikTok stream trend, yeah, it's funny and it's strange and we can laugh at the people involved, the losers who would donate to this garbage, and the vapid women who create it. Laugh from a distance, by the way, don't harass them. But there is something more there. There is actually a subculture of people who think this sort of thing is normal and desirable and even enviable, like you should aspire to be this. And they're looking at you like you're a dumb hick because you don't agree. This is, in its own way, a culture clash between elves and hobbits, between purple glob-eating aliens and humans. It's not meant for you, which is why you don't understand it and why you can't really understand it. All I can say to that is, be thankful you're not the type of person that it is meant for.
Yeah, for real. All right, guys, that about does <laughs> True it. True story. Enjoyed the video today. If you want to see more dev action, I've got two things coming up for you right now. If you're watching this on release, I'll be streaming tonight. So come by and say hi. Also, my girlfriend and I went to go see the new Indiana Jones movie, and we shot a vlog about that. I'll see you there. Have a good one. I love you. Are you zillowing your boss's house to see what she paid? Awkward. Well, now you can zillow a home loan for your own house. Now who's the boss? Rocky Mountain Car Wash in Belgrade is open 24-7 all winter long. The self-service exit doors may be closed when you drive by, but we are open. We keep exit doors down to keep wind and snow out so you're more comfortable. Heated floors add extra comfort by eliminating ice so there are no slippery spots. Monthly yeah. memberships start at just $19.95. And don't forget vacuums are all... I don't like how my... I don't like how my red is just... How my... I mean, not red. What the fuck? How my five is just trapped in there. It's kind of bullshit. Whoa. And I got a three trapped here. <sighs> now you move it out. Yes. Does COVID vaccine skepticism or trust? A video where he raises doubts over the safety of COVID vaccines. Any of you that want to have unshakable faith in the emergence of these vaccines, do not Google Pfizer scandal. And that gets over a million views. Okay, so what, what I you would do if you were him is you'd go pivot. down into here, move that so that I can move this five out. I, I, I don't have to lose. Now my move voice. that nine so I, I can move my five out. If he's smart, that's I, what he does. He be like, Vaccines sure are scary in the sense that they're not and save lots of lives and are a marvel of modern medicine. But he's not That's smart. What they want you to think, you know, they being, again, a lot of the scientists who develop these vaccines aren't actually making the billions of dollars. Of the I thought he was going to say the Jews. <laughs> That's what I mean when I say they. Who produce and sell the vaccines make. In fact, a lot of them are doing it because they believe in furthering the human experience. Is what they want you to think. The corporate state and global media war against free speech. Global media. How do I know? Take a guess. So Russell Brand has been in the news lately, and if you haven't thought about him since his divorce from Katy Perry, you might have missed his um transformation you might remember brand as a left-wing comedian who got famous in the 2010s for saying things yeah he was a left-wing comedian for well sure any of us are treated with discrimination he built himself as an anti-establishment anti-corporate free thing he still is that <laughs> he's definitely not right wing based on the massive redistribution of wealth heavy taxation of corporations he would go viral for having all of these ridiculous fights with fox news hosts strive to be fair <laughs> Yeah. When The Guardian named him as one of the heroes of 2014, they described him as the best thing that's happened to the left in years. When they say conservative, what are they trying to conserve, actually? It's hatred. But 2023 oh, Russell Brand has a slightly different vibe. New footage appears to show that January the 6th was not an attempted insurrection. There's only eight of us! How can this be a thorough clinical trial? Election interference in the Clinton campaign. Yeah, no, he's definitely not conservative. He's just anti-establishment. The past few years, Brand has become a right-wing darling. He hosts a daily live stream where he regularly features right-wing... Now, I would say that a lot of right-wing people do really like him because he does kind of support them, but he's not fucking right-wing. I hate how a lot of pe a lot of people who are right wing nowadays act like a bunch of these left wing people who are just don't fucking hate us. I guess like that, that's basically it. Is we just love people who don't hate us now because we because we've we're just so pathetic now. I don't know. Ah. 
man, these people suck at this game. They can't communicate. <laughs> This almost makes me want to set, kill, <laughs> to set and kill, uh, purple. I think I'm gonna do that. I think I'm gonna set, kill, purple, set. Yeah. Mmm, or should I? No. We don't do that. Because what's going on with purple and... And uh, black right now is good for me. I don't want to stop ben that. Shapiro, Jordan Peterson, Candace Owens, and Tucker Carlson. You've got everything you need, can offer you I've any more my... snacks, nicotine, I've gum. Got... He's become a major peddler of conspiracies about everything from vaccines to the war in Ukraine to the Clinton body count. The statistically high number of people that have taken unusual decisions after knowing the Clinton. And he's become buddy buddy with the same right wing news outlets that he used to condemn. So we are honored to have him with us. Ah! Stay free with I should have! Rumble? It's like, why did this Rumble? happen? How did we go from this left wing commie scum named Russell Brand to this? <laughs> I'm super excited. I'm welcoming Russell Brand to the show. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's good. I I'm glad you got those two clips just to show like how everyone's like, oh, yeah. It's oh, he's one of us now. Good, good. Yeah. Who is this guy? The surf times. In this interview is over. I'm gonna start recording. You keep harassing. Is this me. is this a business? Yeah. Is it your business? You no. Know. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So he's a leftist. Call the police about if it's to find out if it's a business. <laughs> and the circle is. Then he publishes COVID vaccines, skepticism or trust, a video where he raises doubts over the safety of COVID vaccines. Any of you that want to have unshakable faith in the emergence of these vaccines, do not Google Pfizer scandal. And that gets oh. over a million views. Okay, so what I'm seeing here is that kind of like, you know, organization or some kind of ethnic group or something like that. It's rich, rich folk are doing that. Is what they want. Views, but they're not exactly viral, in part because they're kind of heady. Fear is just a thing we've got to travel through. Brand invites a bunch of left-wing thinkers to have these messy, complicated conversations about economics and revolution and the dangers of celebrity culture. It's all good, but it's kind of... You know what's funny is I never thought about this, but it's... You know that uphill battle you always tell people when people are like, well, yeah, they're always saying that, like, science and facts, like, you know, uh, is, is lefty bias. And it's like, it's not lefty bias. It's just if you're going down your own personal journey trying to learn about history, the world, everything from, you know, like, colonization, oppression, economic systems, capitalism, slavery... Uh, all, all that kind of stuff. As you go down that research path, you're eventually going to start to learn how these systems work, and then you're like, oh, okay, so I understand this now. And then, if you are like uh, someone who doesn't want them to be per in perpetuity or perpetuate themselves or make everyone's lives worse, then you're like, okay, well, I guess, yeah, I am a leftist. I I oppose the oppression. Ew, of the cringe. And are doing that, and they're creating artificial hierarchies. And I get that now. I see it. But like, all that mucho texto. That's mucho texto. Mucho Texto doesn't do good. It's not a good internet currency, you know? Just just talking about that kind of stuff that way. Whereas, like, if you got just, like, yeah, um, beer is gay. Yeah, gay beer. Uh, Bud Light, it, it makes you... Uh, I don't think that that's the criticism of Bud Light. We understand that degeneracy gay, can destroy uh, a civil... Uh, you go gay, so gay civilization. Beer, gay beer, gay. I know a lot of people are going to be like, whoa, what? The, the beer's gay. Crazy. Oh, yeah, I'll click on this. Yeah, this guy's saying the beer's gay or something. Interesting. Yeah. What else has he got? Apparently, the Fauci ouchie is trying to kill me and turn me into goo. Oh, I don't want that. I don't want to turn into goo. All right, well, click, 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 click. 
inaccessible. Now, how do you build communities around those values? Talk to me about decentralized autonomous communities and how they could work and what the hell that means. In one interview, Brand is talking about how the media uses fear tactics to scare people and pivots to reading philosophy about how humans are too afraid of dying. The subject of death, says Ramdas, is a topic most of us would generally rather avoid. It's giving first date with a freshman philosophy major. And Brand dabbles more and more in this high mindedness until eventually we get to era two. Ah, yes. Around 2017. Bro, this bitch just seems so cringe. Like, I hate these white women that do shit like this. Like, oh, I'm gonna light some incense and do. It's like, fuck off. Quit. Brand decides to pivot. Act He's normal. Still doing some political stuff, but the truth is publishing more and more self help content. You need a spiritual... This is the area that I was introduced to him. See, I'm one of the people who knew Russell Brand from all those comedies and then didn't pay much attention to any of these phases. I knew of the truths, but it just seemed like... It seemed like it was always just too rich, famous celebrity analysis of, like, politics for me, and so it just didn't really interest me that much. Like, fair enough, like, Jon Stewart is a rich, famous celebrity too, and like, I really loved his show, but, like, that... I, I just... I enjoyed, I guess, the comedy of it and, and his analysis more than I ever did Russell Brand's kind of, like, you know, baby's first anti-capitalism practice in order to be happy. He publishes a couple of self-help books about recovering from addiction. Any behavior that you'd like to change, this book can help you with it. He starts inviting on spiritual readers and other self-help authors and doing guided meditations and focusing on huh? like how I self -sabotage. Isn't that uh, <laughs> Wu Ha? The guy who like, like ha the guy who does like the cold plunges and shit and does a <laughs> Is this person botting out? No. They scare me that they might be botting out. No, wait, oops. Freedom from pain <laughs> and five habits that could destroy your relationship. How are you going to stop self sabotaging? He's still doing the free thinker shtick, but now he's really free. If consciousness has always been present, then we have a. So I just get, did a good deed for. Uh, black so hopefully they understand that Weird. A chance of real change rather than superficially shuffling chessboard pieces around on the black and white Masonic grid of our. Uh, Are you waxing poetic? Uh, what, who's them dudes? Illuminati. It's all pretty harmless. Illuminati. But again, it's, uh, a little heady. What does Russell believe happens after death? Well, my best guess is based somewhat on ideas of pan psychism. 
<laughs> these videos are even worse than his lefty content. A lot of it doesn't even break 100k. Oh, and it ends up good. This guy's smart. But then something happens. Here, the end of 2020, oh, Brandon posting his typical content. How money corrupts us. 42,000 views. How does panic last? 63,000 views. Can loneliness destroy you? 86,000 views. Then he publishes COVID vaccines, skepticism or trust, a video where he raises doubts over the safety of COVID vaccines. <sighs> Is she saying that he's a grifter? I mean, I, I assume that that's what she's basically saying is that he's just grifting, which maybe he is. I don't know. Do not Google Pfizer scandal. And that gets over a million views mm. and the commenters are thrilled. Have to be honest, never use it. Okay, so what I'm seeing here is that I have to pivot in my content quite a bit if I want to win at the game. I, I, I don't have to lose my morals. I, I just have to be a little bit more sneaky. Right? I can, can be like, vaccines sure are scary in the sense that they're not and save lots of lives and are a marvel of modern medicine. Uh, no, vaccines are scary. Is what they want you to think. You know, they... This guy is so cringe. What the fuck? Being, again, a lot of the scientists who develop these vaccines aren't actually making the billions Shut the of dollars fuck up. to produce and sell the vaccines make. In fact, a lot of them are doing it because they believe in furthering the human experience. Really? You think that? You, th you actually think that it's not that they're... It's what they want you to think. You know, they, yeah, the elites... The globalists, rich people, rich people. I don't want anyone to think that by me saying that I'm implying that it's some kind of like you know, organization or some kind of ethnic group or something like that. I just rich, rich folk are doing that. Is what they want you to think. Yeah, it's not too hard. I could, I could do that. I just gotta add. It's what they want you to think at the end of every sentence that might be factual, and then, and then be like, uh, do, you, do you think I believe that? I don't. Bro, I like how he's saying that he has to do that. He has to act like he's a conservative. But there's a ton of liberal streamers who are famous nowadays. Like, a lot. Oh. You're going to try to card block me. Or does he just really think that he... Huh. What is he doing? He is. He's card block. He's trying to card block me. What a douche. I don't know. I, I'm not taking a position one way or another. This is what they I hope you know that if you keep this up, I'm going to slam you. I'm just going to hit your fucking shit. You're not gonna fucking card block me. I hate when people do you know? the, do this yeah, tactic. But this channel's actually awesome. It's I just slammed just them. Jimmy Dore. <laughs> no, Jimmy Dore wouldn't be really trying to say it in any kind of, you know. I, I hope I can uh, piece together more words than Jimmy Dore can, because he's just gonna be like, yeah, look at this. Look at all this. Look, look what they're trying to convince you of. What do you mean? Jimmy Dore? <laughs> Is pretty well spoken. I don't know how I've gone this long and just found Russell's YouTube. This is what they want you to think. I've never been a fan of Russell, but he makes some intelligent points here. And Brand goes back to his normal content. Save yourself by saving others. Thirty-seven thousand views. Annie uh, Lennox on how it feels to be an entertainer. Eighty thousand views. Wow, it this is really damning. I have like I've seen a lot of analysis of Russell Brand. Usually, it comes from a perspective that he was clearly starting to get more into you know doing right wing and, and right wing reactionary content because obviously it was providing him with a lot more uh, audience and numbers and stuff. But like this is kind of striking to show that you can actually distinctly show that as he's going and experimenting in different kinds of phases of his early Early YouTube career that there's a point I wonder if he's trying to card block me or if he just wants Asia because if he's trying to card block me and he's not going for Asia that even pisses me off more 
sudden it's like, yeah, uh, 60,000, 70,000, 80,000, 1.1 million, 60,000, 80,000. So, like, clearly it's like, oh, okay, so y'all want to see more of that then, do you? With the pandemic being used to mask a wealth and power transfer, 1.5 million views. And the commenters are eating it up. I have a renewed respect and admiration for this man. Why am I so late in realizing that this guy is utterly brilliant? New fan here. Brand quickly realizes that his conspiracy content gets way more engagement than his self-help stuff. So at the end of 2020, it's time for another rebrand, baby. Woo! Ew. Why do the media hate you? Pretty quickly, Brand's channel starts devolving into a cesspool of right-wing paranoia. A relentless march towards tyranny where ordinary people are mercilessly crushed. He starts making videos about the Great Reset, a conspiracy theory that claims that climate change is an excuse to control the people. The Great Reset. You will own nothing and you will be happy. And the videos do incredibly well. 1.1 million. Yeah, he does just want a shot. <laughs> I mean, I'm fine with it as long as I'm able to card collect over here for right now. 2.7 million. So he starts making more and more and more. He branches out to new conspiracy theories, too. Conspiracy theories about Hunter Biden, conspiracy theories about Hillary Clinton, about the war in Ukraine, about the origins of COVID, about the... Bro, they aren't conspiracy theories. They're conspiracy facts. Get it right. This doesn't just speak to like a simple analysis of being like it's AI driven. This is the problem. Like this also speaks towards the fact that like someone like Russell Brand is obviously like anyone else as susceptible to just like the dopamine, the serotonin, and all that kind of feedback that a lot of the social media gives you. And when it's done on a big scale, it's, it's still just scalable, right? Instead of getting like 60,000, 70,000 views, he's not getting a million views. And so he's like, oh, okay, well clearly this is something that a lot of people think I have a very good opinion on. And then you start doing more of that content specifically, which in turn is going to open you up to suddenly having interviews with a lot of different people who may be considered a little bit on the right or a little bit on the alt-right or on the intellectual dark web if you will but like yes some of these people are out and proud bigots and yes some of them Ugh, shut the fuck people. up you bad. fucking they faggot hate people, they hate trans people or they hate gay people right that's usually their substitute for that but i i am coming from this guy sounds like a just a giant faggot <laughs> yeah like i'm fine with some leftists like, even Vosh doesn't bother me that much. But, like, this guy, but this guy, for some reason, just his, I don't know. There's just something about him that just seems so cringe. It's like he's trying too hard. Place of love. I'm, I'm coming from a place of love and acceptance, and I'm not here to spread their hatred. I just want to hear the rest of their messages, which could be important, even if coming from a bigot, right? It's important to have conversations, ideas, etc. Is it time to disband the FBI, or would that amount to shutting down a key wing of the Democrat Party? And these conspiracy theories are a hit. All the videos are... Uh, what do you mean? The Democrats definitely are using the FBI. I just showed you have around a million views or more. You can see in this chart how brands view counts. Also, super valuable to the right. If you can have someone who everyone considers a leftist, like they still to this day say like, oh, one of the biggest accounts on Rumble, top five, I believe. He's like a socialist. Yeah, Russell Brand. Like, no, he's not. <laughs> what the fuck are you saying? Oh, these words have no meaning. I get it. Start spiking once he pivots. I mean, he was like a socialist. He prob he still is like a socialist. He has a lot of socialist ideas for sure. Man, this guy sucks. This guy's so bad. <laughs> Let's see what everyone else does about this. Okay, so purple can break him. Purple should break him. ...to being more reactionary. So Brand pivots even harder. He changes his whole aesthetic. Gone are the days of the soft-spoken wellness guru. Grief is the price we pay for love. Now every video starts with Brand <laughs> just screaming. Grief is the price we pay for love. Why hit the like and subscribe? 
what in my view? I would say that him that that is kind of cringe, but him doing this is more cringe. Right, I for one day. Yes. A bunch of nonsense. Coo, coo. What does it do? It cheers up NATO and it distracts you. His thumbnails no. cringe too. In 2020, they're soothing, simple, and they all feature this like new age symbolism. By 2021, he's going for shock value. Every thumbnail is a split screen of him making some horrified face next to some cheap composite image. This one just says, the end is near, with the title, the establishment wants you dead. It's gimmicky, but it works. I mean, they do. The establishment does want you dead. That is very true. <laughs> Brand's views keep climbing, and as they do, his video titles get more and more ridiculous. At the start of his transformation, it's, was Trump right? Trump was right. Trump is right. But is. pretty quickly, Brand's channel goes full clickbait. It's starting. Here we go. It begins. Why is no one stopping this? It just. Okay, I assume that this. Right? What is Trump that? Trump was right. Trump is right. But is. pretty quickly, Brand's channel goes full clickbait. It's starting. Here we go. It begins. Why is no one? Why is no one stopping this? I'm pretty sure. I wonder what this is about. That looks like it's Justin Trudeau right there. So I'm pretty sure that this one is lit. No. Eight months ago. When was this video posted? Uh, two days ago. Let's see. Let's watch this video. Why is no one stopping this, Russell Brandt? Good news! Justin Trudeau has said that the Canadian truckers are tinfoil hat-wearing conspiracy theorists and the word violent now has been expanded to include violence against money. This should be really good for freedom. <laughs> Hello there, you six million awakening wonders. Thanks for joining me on this voyage towards truth and freedom. Remember... Let's see if anyone does anything about... Am I really going to have to be the one who does something about... I guess I am the one who's... About this situation. Maybe don't card block like that in the fucking biggest place where you... Does he bot out? Better turn on the notification bell and subscribe right now because the algorithm works not for you, not for me, but for mainstream media. You will notice how you are fed stories from the mainstream and how independent journalism is extracted and excluded so that, of course, you remain docile and compliant. Don't think for yourself and demand individual and community freedom. That would be my guess. Let me know what your guess is in the comments below. We have got a fantastic story for you today. Justin Trudeau has called the truckers conspiracy theory believing tinfoil hat wearing 
right-wing, Nazi, misogynist, racist. Qui croient pas dans la science, qui sont souvent misogynes, qui souvent racistes. Like that, that's what they got together for, to do some tinfoil hat wearing and some racism and some misogyny. Not what they said, that they were protesting against vaccine mandates and restrictions against their rights as workers. No, do they it. got together to do some misogyny. Also, and this is amazing, remember at the time they were accused of being violent. Well, there was no evidence that they ever were violent. So do you know what you do to solve that problem? Just change what the word violent means. That's no problem. You were violent against what? Was it people's hearts, people's minds, people's feelings? No, against money. You were violent against the globalist state's ultimate goal. Don't to do accumulate it. accumulate wealth. Once they start changing the meaning of words, we are in serious trouble. That's beyond Orwellian. Let's get into this story. During a recent interview with CTV News, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau doubled down on his remarks regarding the trucker protest of 2022, referring to some of the activists as tinfoil hat conspiracy theorists who engage in disinformation and misinformation. You did a bit of disinformation, but then worse than that, you did some misinformation and you did that while wearing a tin. Good news! Justin Trudeau has said that the Canadian truckers are tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy theorists and the word violent now has been expanded to include violence against money. This should be really good for freedom. <laughs> Hello there, you six million awakening wonders. Thanks for joining me on this voyage towards truth and freedom. Remember to turn on the notification bell and subscribe right now because the algorithm works not for you, not for me, but for mainstream media. You will notice how you are fed stories from the mainstream and how independent journalism is extracted and excluded so that, of course, you remain docile and compliant. Don't think for yourself and demand individual and community freedom. That would be my guess. Let me know what your guess is in the comments below. We have got a fantastic story for you today. Justin Trudeau has called the truckers conspiracy theory believing tinfoil hat wearing Nazi misogynist racist qui croient pas dans la science qui sont souvent misogynes qui souvent racistes like that, that's what they got together for, to do some tinfoil hat wearing and some racism and some misogyny not what they said that they were protesting against vaccine mandates and restrictions against their rights as workers no they got together to do some misogyny also and this is amazing remember at the time they were accused of being violent well there was no evidence that they ever were violent so do you know what you do to solve that problem? Just change what the word violent means. That's no problem. You were violent against what? Was it people's hearts, people's minds, people's feelings? No, against money. You were violent against the globalist state's ultimate goal to accumulate wealth. Once they start changing the meaning of words, we are in serious trouble. That's beyond Orwellian. Let's get into this story. During a recent interview with CTV News, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau doubled down on his remarks regarding the trucker protest of 2022, referring to some of the activists as tinfoil hat conspiracy theorists who engage in disinformation and misinformation. You did a bit of disinformation, but then worse than that, you did some misinformation and you did that while wearing a tinfoil hat. Well, at least I wasn't wearing blackface. When someone believes <laughs> that your government is trying to inject a vaccine into you to control your mind and track you and there's a microchip in it, that's almost the definition of a government conspiracy theory. I would say when governments are closing down bank accounts of people that are donating to a private, now you put that, that here. Is a conspiracy theory. Theory. When a government is evoking Put that emergency here. powers to shut down a legitimate or are you protest, stupid? that is tyranny. When a government is accusing its own population of being misogynist and racist simply to shut down dissent, that is tyranny. Now, I don't think there are many people that are saying that the vaccine is putting microchips. And one of the things that the mainstream does is elevates fringe ideas to dismiss legitimate dissent. And if there is dissent, if there is opposition to their corporate globalist goals, they simply amplify certain voices within it. If you get a protest of 100,000 people, like if you get a sporting event with 60, 80,000 people at it, you're going to get people that get drunk, people that shout crazy stuff. As long as you can continually condemn and criticise individuals within an ordinary population, you don't have to address the real issues. And this is what I would say the real issues are. National governments have been co-opted by globalist interests. We have increasing surveillance. I would just move that up to there. Centralising currencies. A march towards preventing individual freedom, controlling your ability to have meaningful democracy democratic traction in your community. These are real problems that go beyond left, right type arguments. Remember, here on this channel, what we believe the problem is, is that we're being turned against one another by centralizing, globalizing interests. And Justin Trudeau, I believe, used the mask of wokeness to distract you from the fact that he's operating on behalf of globalist interests. And that's not the only mask he uses. However, this statement by the Prime Minister differs from his remarks during the onset of the protest when he referred to the demonstration in its entirety as a fringe minority. 
minority. So first of all, you say it's a small number of people, but if it's only a small number of people, how can you invoke emergency actions? You don't need to. Both yeah. those two things can't be true. It can't be a small fringe. It was what I thought it was about, was the trucker thing, where they were literally fucking shutting down people's bank accounts over a protest. So, yeah, who is... Why is no one stopping this? Yeah, why is no one st for real? Why is no one stopping that? That's bullshit. It's over. They're shutting down people's bank accounts over a protest. All this gloom and doom paranoia brings brands a new financial opportunity: sponsorship. In 2021, brands' videos start including advertisements for supplements. The world's first probiotic to support gut, brain, and immune health. And God knows you need good natural immunity these days. Right, kids? Greens powder. Field of Greens is a science-backed formula of specific fruits and vegetables. You Field won't of Greens, in any of course. Other product. I thought, of course. Gold. There More is a way greens. to secure your hard-earned nest egg. American Heart for Gold make it easy to protect your savings and retirement accounts with physical gold. And Brand isn't doing this alone. He starts inviting more and more right-wing guests onto his show. In 2021, he interviews Ben Shapiro, and it becomes one of his most viewed videos of all time. Shapiro invites Brand on his show. You know, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. Russell, thanks so much for joining the show. It's great to talk to you. Wow, man, you do a good job of this. Thanks, Ben. His new shtick gets him invited on other shows, too. He goes on Joe Rogan to... Yeah, bro, you go on shows. Even shows that you don't agree with. Complain about the Democrats. I don't think that they are creating an agenda to advance. Jimmy Dore is hawking silver and uh, Jackson Hinkle is selling gold. Because, you know, get those rare earth minerals. They'll always become more valuable. Put all your money into gold and buy it through me. Yes. Wants the interests of vulnerable people. He goes on Bill Maher to complain about MSNBC. I've been on that MSNBC, yeah. mate. It was right. propaganda. And then in 2023, he goes on Fox News, the network he has spent his career criticizing. Not as a critic, but as a hero. Russell Brand has been an actor, a comedian, a podcast host for decades. Yeah, probably just because he likes Tucker Carlson, not that he likes all of Fox News. It's all of a sudden he's one of the most forceful voices for the truth in the English-speaking world. So what happened here? Is it possible that Russell Brand genuinely had a radical change of heart and mind in less than a year? Maybe? I mean, I'm not in his brain, thank God. But there's a simpler explanation for what's <clears throat> happening here. Call it Rift Drift. See, the problem with the kind of free thinking that Russell Brand left the era is that it's hard to Not like stop. Tokyo Drift. Sure, cool. Brand can complain about Fox News and talk about how the media sensationalizes things to keep us watching, but like, then what? How many times can you tell people they need to focus on more serious issues like environmental justice or antitrust laws or possible alternatives to capitalism? Like, oh my God, it's so boring. Uh, yeah. There's no story arc. There's no heroes not, and villains. Not, not there's no sex. And more importantly, there's no reason to keep coming back. If the problem is that corporate... To be fair, no sex would actually probably be a great thing for Russell Brand to engage in. Because I don't know if this video is going to get to that, but that whole history of being a sexual abuser and having to be covered up by a lot of, like, major fucking industries uh, and media empires, that's fucked up. That's like... They uh, that was all lies. Theory for you. Like, did, did you know that? This isn't even a conspiracy that a lot of... Like, uh, yeah, he definitely was a fucking... He definitely was a fucking, like, horn dog, but I don't think that he was, uh, actually, I don't think he really even had to, would have to Powerful do men that. get away with a lot of fucked up shit and sexual assault throughout years. We're even talking, like, pedophilia, if there are, again, a lot of other powerful entities that are going to cover up for them and protect them. Media sensationalizes things, then why not turn it off? You could just stop watching Fox. Go outside, touch grass. Call your mom. Tell her. How about you touch grass? Tell you love her. Find a stranger. Give him a kiss consensually. Start a religion. I don't know. What's the point in watching Brand make? No, don't start a religion. Go to church. Don't start a fucking religion. same argument over and over and over again in his self-proclaimed last episode of the truth even brand admitted that he was bored of making these same free-thinking arguments about the media how far can you go with this cyclical reporting on cyclical news so then what is brand really selling 
what the trends <gasps> ban? Do people really want to watch a washed up comedian explain how money corrupts us or how we need a global revolution against corporate power? Obviously not. Turns out free thinking is hard to monetize. It can't be good, can it, to spend all this time, our eyes resting on screens. People wow. Purple just got bullied the shit out of. Maybe Purple's smart, though, and understands that he wants to come out here. And then he's going to move back in. Mm -hmm. People on the other side of the screen hiding... Man, he used to be so new age. That's fucking hilarious. <laughs> Just straight up, even with like the music and everything. It's like, is that sitar? Is he like, you know, trying to do some little thing? Is Black just gonna sit in there? Oh, yes! No, he isn't. Darn it. I was really hoping Black was just gonna sit in there. <gasps> Bro. <laughs> Black. Oh, man. The more people can actually think for themselves, the less they need carnival barkers like Brandon. That was funny. Bad for engagement. Conspiracy theories give grifters like Brand a way to keep. I love what Black just did there. That's hilarious. Like it's not gonna end well for him, but oh man, that's gonna help me out a ton. Scare your audience. Globalist agenda, the relationship between governments, big business, and a corrupt media are able to crush any dissent. Then you keep them loyal. Only I can be trusted because mm. everyone else is lying to you. You have to find figures. I mean, a lot of people will tell you that, and like, you know, they're they're obviously grifters, but unlike them, I'm the only one you should trust, okay? Because I tell you, you should trust me. Trust no one, all right? Trust no one. And that's why you should trust me for, for all things like me, that you trust in media and get your information from them. Brand's videos will often hammer this message home with titles like, we predicted this, and we saw this coming, and we knew it. And then, once you've got them loyal to you, you charge them. Give me money so I can keep exposing the truth. All those other sources, they'll lie to you. But I would never do that because I love you. I love you, and so, if you believe in free speech, <laughs> I just can't do this guy. <laughs> it's an ad. It's an ad read. I mean his, his laugh pisses me off. Bro, all dudes. What the fuck is this bullshit? Let's see if he attacks that. I don't know if he is going to. It'd make more sense for him to go after fucking Black, because Black is the one who's just screwing him over. And it, uh, I don't know. He hasn't hit me yet, so why the fuck would he now? What you do is you fucking put right here and you threaten black. I mean, I understand saying it as a sign off or something like that. You should just love people. You know, love everyone. You know, there's nothing wrong with saying that. But be like, I fucking love you. And that's why you need fucking gold. As much fucking gold as you can buy right now. What? Does he think that Russell Brandt is... Does he think that Russell Brandt is uh, Irish? Or what? 
I'm confused. up to power, refusing to believe their lies, and finding new truths together, then join my Awakened Wonders community. Money, please! <laughs> the 2022 brand launch the locals community, where fans could pay $60 a year to talk to each other and see some extra videos of him. $60 a year. Now and join our movement. Bathe in the rapture. Charging money for discords is, oh, as soon as you're in that, like, you know you're in a shady part of the internet, right? From the Andrew Tates to the fucking Russell Brands, where it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll sell you a code. A code that gets you access to an exclusive club. One that I don't have. Bro, there's so many people who sell discords. I wonder if he's just waiting for him to step out. Doesn't make a lot of sense. have to do a lot of overhead or anything you know i can just have some unpaid mods in there and make sure the whole thing's safe but you get exclusive access to a community that only you will be able to participate in and truly it'll be worth this money that you should pay monthly by the way the 60 bucks like it's not a one-time thing you're gonna have to renew it the access code that is it, it'll only be valid for 30 days but then next month you can buy it again and be part of this exclusive club and then we can really take down the man as i enrich myself immensely become uh no that's not what it is today. People say this is like a cult. They sure do. And to be fair, he's not the first cult leader to do this. In fact, right. Brand's conspiracy shtick is almost identical to what another conspiracy theorist has been doing for the last 20 years. Alex Jones. Oh my goodness. Like yeah, and Alex Jones has been right about most shit. Like Brand, Jones built himself as an anti-establishment free thinker. They just want to extinguish thinkers because it's like a big bright light in a room of vampires. They don't like it. Like Brand, he used conspiracy theories to keep his viewers loyal to him. Folks, I've been told this by high up folks. They say, listen, <laughs> Obama and Hillary both smell like sulfur. And like Brand, he used that loyalty. Obama and Hillary both smell like sulfur. To make money. <laughs> That's so fucking funny. To doomsday press <laughs> investment in freedom and fight the global so we need the funds desperately. At one point in 2018, Jones's show was making $800,000. <sighs> Do you have any idea how much $800,000 a day is? I don't, like what is that number? As the New York Times reported. Bro, why did she sound like that? Like, what is that number? His fundamental insight was that his, his viewers loyal to him. Folks, I've been told this by high up folks. They say, listen, Obama and Hillary both smell like sulfur. And <laughs> Bro, that's funny. Selling everything from nutritional supplements to doomsday prep supplies. To investment in freedom and fight the global so we need the funds desperately. At one point yes. in 2018, Jones's show was making $800,000 a day. Do you have any idea how much $800,000 a day is? $800,000 a day? That's fucking awesome. I don't like what is that number as the new york times reported Jones do you see how much he's getting sued for though bro? also a nearly captive market for the um you better not so i think you forgive the tier one sub to the surf times hello surf timies uh, Good to give, a, give a big thank you for products that. intended to assuage the same fears he stokes this is do or die time if you want to keep us on air they are trying to silence you they're trying to take down the leading voice of like the shitty thing about this is he's selling people vitamins, you know, overpriced vitamins or like turmeric. Bro, you know, what like is this? He's, he's selling them like soy and lead, apparently. Like some of his shit is like d definitively unhealthy for you. But he's not even selling his audience good shit. Like I would even have a little bit more respect if he was like, oh, now you got to buy Alex Jones brand weed. Here's a whole bunch of like weed. It'll, it'll help you if you like. Yeah, weed. of course you like, would, you like, fucking you degenerate. Said you were going to sell something, something. But telling them that this is like alpha male potency brain force plus like the alpha uh, tea, I'll, like only by buying my product can you truly be able to get rid of your soy and then attack by eating soy. Oh no! Like, I forgot that there was a bot up here. Oh fuck, I fucked up. Hopefully I didn't, but I think I did for sure. Ooh.
How is purple still ahead of me? <laughs> so pathetic. It's just so bizarre. Like, the shit is unhealthy. It's extremely overpriced. Vitamins, by the way, you know how you get a lot of vitamins? You get them for free by eating vegetables. Eat your vegetables, kids. There's a reason people tell you that. Because you know what's in vegetables? A this guy is such a fucking cuck. Fuck ton of vitamins that your body, pr like, processes very well. Like, honestly, if you want to save yourself a ton of money, don't buy all these, like, oh, my new multivitamin, blah, 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 blah. Who knows what the fuck is inside there? Eat fruit. Eat vegetables. Eat fruit and vegetables and have some legumes. And then guess what? You're going to get a whole bunch of vitamins and nutrients. You're going to get energy. You're going to be like, oh, my God, I'm turning carbon into... In can you shut the fuck up, bro? To useful energy that I can then use and, and empowers me. That's true. It, it's called vegetables. And again, it's going to be way cheaper than all that shit. Resistance. But while Jones and, and Brand yes, may be obviously. using the same shtick, there's one big difference between them. See, Alex Jones had to build his conspiracy empire from the ground up. Well, I can assure you, I don't make any money off public access. In 1999, <laughs> Jones got fired from his local radio station for being a wacko. And he had to start broadcasting his radio show independently. For being right? For being right. Anytime he dabbled in conspiracy theories, he'd get yeeted by a bunch of radio stations. Oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. He was a fringe outlier and it took him decades Your body only crazy before well, he got enough what's attention it's to creative, break into so. the mainstream. But now, we're in the golden age of grifters, baby. Thanks to YouTube, Bran was making an estimated $2,000 to $4,000 per video posting every day. That's up to $1.46 million a year in YouTube alone. At the end of 2022, Brand used his YouTube channel to announce he was moving to Rumble, a right-wing video platform that's riddled with QAnon and anti-vax conspiracy theorists. We but one of the few places where there's still quite a bit of VC funding, because Peter Thiel wants to keep on pumping up those numbers and getting more people signed, you know? They can still spend a lot of money while losing a fuck ton of money. Like, Rumble, it is a money pit, but it does give them an uncensorable alternative to YouTube. <sighs> to move to rumble to assure that we are not censored further we would prefer yeah and again it's 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 the same grift right whether it's steven crowder giving it russell brand giving it they all say the same thing like russell i uh, sorry steven crowder went a step further where he's like i i think that it's really bad for you to have social media it's bad for all of us so you should actually delete all of your social media accounts here's how you do it here's the steps to delete each one of your social medias except for rumble except for my channel except for mug Club. Those are the only places where you should still keep your social media accounts. Get, get rid of everything else, but then follow me and get all your information from me and then get all your products from me and make sure you only buy the things that I sell you. Then, yeah, this, this is cult behavior. Uh, you joined us on Rumble. He got an exclusive deal with Rumble producing a show called Stay Free, which is ironic considering how often he uses it to beg for money. We need you with us now more than ever. Brand is airing his comedy special, Brandemic. Directly on Locals, which is a crowdfunding site for free speech proponents. Who uh, Dave Rubin's thing. That's hilarious. Dave Rubin, the fucking, the little comedian that couldn't. The, you know, the most unfunny man on the planet. If you look up failed comedian in Google Images, he's still the number one picture that pops up. He, he's come full circle to where now Russell Brand has to release his comedy special on Locals. And while he still posts on YouTube, he mainly uses it to I know, steer I gotta get fans on towards platforms where he can charge them money. If conspiracy theorists can keep some form of presence on a mainstream platform, they will. Because they understand that the purpose of that is to reach new audiences. They will use alt tech platforms for more extreme content, speaking to a harder audience. Join us on Rumble every single day. This has been...
lean into the whole pollution is making the kids gay. Ugh, I don't know if we could transform because the problem is that they're never going to want to go after oil and gas and those industries because those industries line their pockets. So there's never going to be a like, hey, even if we convince someone in a culture war issue that this is doing something bad, you should go after like, you know, the very polluters that are destroying the planet. They're always going to be supported by those polluters. The reason it's always going to be harder for especially like the left to have like a, a large voice in independent media and stuff like that is that like at the end of the day, at the end of the like you know the road or whatever you want to call it there's not an endless amount of money in the very idea that capitalism is really fucking a lot of the world over right like if your message is distinctly at the very end of its core anti-capitalist then you're going to get to a point where capitalists and those with capital are not going to want to support that like why would they give a whole bunch of money unless they're like well this person is just so ineffective at what they do that it's really good to fund them so maybe i'll throw what is he even saying a lot of the world over right like if you're mess or issue that this is doing something bad you should go after like you know the very polluters that are destroying the planet they're always going to be supported by those polluters the reason it's always going to be harder for especially like the left to have like a, a large voice in independent media and stuff like that is that like at the end of the day at the end of the like you know the road or whatever you want to call it there's not an endless amount of money in the very idea that capitalism is really fucking a lot of the world over right like if your message is distinctly at the very end of its core anti-capitalist then you're going to get to good capitalists and those with capital are not going to want to support that like, why would they give a bunch Good. of money instead of like, well, this person is just so ineffective at what they do. Good. Really fun, like, so maybe I'll throw them a whole bunch of cash in this regard. But it's when Good. you start, like, playing around in right-wing sides, and you've seen other people do this. Not just Russell Brand, by the way, who's gone clearly from, like, a leftist to a right-winger very, very quickly in a short amount of time. But if you see people like Jimmy Dore, for example, Jimmy Dore has always, you know, advertised himself as, like, I am the left, I am the leftist, I, you know, I hate the Republicans and the Democrats because they're all just corporate institutions. I want to tear the whole thing down. But I'm also going to play very flirty with a lot of topics that i know the right loves and make me a lot of money such as anti-vax conspiracies which anti-vax conspiracies this doesn't need to be a politicized left or right thing it has become one but it is something that I'll, at the end of the day if we just listen to scientists or scientists on this topic the scientists themselves are very very clear and conclusively said and demonstrated through just you know us existing that these are very very good and safe and effective ways of preventing the mass spread uh, no, they're not. They're very serious diseases that can kill a lot of us. We've known this for a while, actually. So it's not like a new development. A lot of the technology may be newer. And yes, mRNA technology is different, say, than the traditional vaccines of, you know, giving a killed or weakened virus to someone to let their body... What the fuck was that? Oh, he probably just didn't have time. I'm up back up at the top. Oh. Natural immunity to it, and then they can beat that off when they experience it in the world. Yeah, but they put all sorts of fucked up shit in it. I don't think that they're trying to poison and kill us. Like, I don't. I don't know, maybe they fucking are, but I think that it does that it does have a lot of fucked up shit in it. Yes, it's it's different, but like at the end of the day, the fundamental principles remain the same in that this can prevent you from some of the worst, you know, either getting sick, contracting it, uh, going to the hospital, Good hospitalization. Job. But it became one. And now it's a heavily politicized issue where you will see right wingers and left wingers, Democrats, Republicans, liberals, yeah. conservatives get split on this. Where where it's like, well, yeah, because big pharma bad and evil. But why are you saying big pharma bad? Are, are you saying big pharma bad because ultimately we are going to make a, a critique of corporatization, of capitalism, of taking public funding to develop something, but then at the end of the day, having it being sold back to people at huge amounts of money? Is that what you're coming at this? No. No, Fauci bad. Vaccines evil. They make your heart explode. Uh, they turn you into goo. I mean, they do kind of fuck you up. Have you heard of myocarditis? Yeah, well, did you know that this one specific study shows that this can actually raise the potential for you to have myocarditis? Yes, yes. That, that same study also demonstrates that catching COVID will have worse potential effects mathematically, just in terms of the large uh, percentage of the population. 
Can this guy shut the fuck up? It? Yeah, than the, the few people who may experience myocarditis. Also, you can't just use one study. you got to use what are called meta-studies in this case. And there are other studies which I could use that don't show He sounds like such a liberal cuck. The mRNA vaccine, but that wouldn't be honest for me to do that because other studies have shown that it can increase the chance. And most doctors will let their patients know this. They'll be like, there are risks associated with this. These risks do not outweigh the benefits. In our assessment, it is safe for you to take this. That's exhausting to have to keep repeating, but that's how the whole thing works out. New reality of the free thinking rift economy. Conspiracy theorists like Alex Jones used to have to worry about going too far and losing access to mainstream platforms, but now they don't. Thanks, Soul Life. I appreciate you. Like Brand oh my goodness. There, she's complaining that they have too much freedom freedom of speech. Jones is now broadcasting a show on Rumble. Joe Rogan has the biggest podcast on Spotify. Tucker Carlson gets millions of views on Twitter. And there are dozens of popular conspiracy yeah, that's theories based. on YouTube. This is the did she really just say that Tim Pool is a conspiracy theory channel? Uh, no. I forget what that guy's name is, but yeah, maybe. I don't even know who that guy is. Steven Crowder. Nah. I don't know. Probably not a conspiracy theorist. the greatest day in paul joseph watson's life okay the fact that he's still included and popped up here that's wild because paul paul's really falling off okay paul got is that this guy the british guy Exposed for actually being kind of like someone who's actually kind of maybe into sex workers and enjoying watching pornography and buying pornography and sex workers and that kind of shit as well as like a raging raging racist huge anti-semite hates jewish people his secret recordings are fucking whoa that man is a fucking he is a white supremacist of the highest order but also just really annoying you know and and one that like his annoyance versus his controversy they, they're not kind of in balance anymore kind of like a like a milo you know he's basically a milo but this is a big day you're 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 you're, you're appearing in a brand new media matters video there you go oh i'm in These media matters cross-pollinating tucker goes on brand show then brand goes on rogue and then rogan goes on no, jones Paul isn't gay. and jones uses his show super to straight his viewers back to tucker we're very, very proud of you tucker and your team oh my goodness this is basically just uh her saying that i this is basically her just doing the fucking alt-right pi pipeline but nowadays i guess Good job. Good job. It's a circuit yeah. of conspiracy grifters all going on each other's platforms so that they can sell their viewers merch and subscriptions. So many of Alex Jones' ideas have entered into the mainstream. He's a brilliant person to talk to. He's an extraordinary man. Brand isn't a free thinker. He's a performer who is adapting his act to whatever he thinks will make him the most money. True. And now that there's an entire conspiracy economy to profit off, he won't be the last. Bro, I'm not gonna let you keep that. Quit trying uh, so to go for was that. The very first uh, original Media Matters content video produced and directed uh, in part by Carlos Maza, who is now the new Media Matters uh, content director. He's going to be making. Yeah, Media Matters sucks. Like this really really good to see well researched well presented uh you know good good framing of the whole thing even had the kind of i'll let you hold it for a minute because you're so far behind but someone else doesn't fucking attack you i'm gonna end up having to break you
right. Let's go home. I like how it says he's so desperate. You're just jealous that you didn't get a fucking... You're just jealous that you didn't... Get, uh... Sponsored by the... I mean, uh, interviewed by Putin. Like, there are literally real journalists showing the Russian perspective on the war. Except those journalists are in jail. Vladimir Putin put them in jail. So, like, I'm sorry, but that's a little crazy when you got American journalists in jail. That's insane. Bro, he's a... <laughs> All right, let's talk about Tucker Carlson interviewing Vladi Poo. We're in Moscow tonight. We're here to interview the president of Russia, Vladimir Putin. We'll be doing that soon. There are risks to conducting an interview like this, obviously. So we've thought about it carefully over many months. Here's why we're doing it. First, because it's our job. We're in journalism. Our duty is to inform people. Two years into a war that's reshaping the entire world, most Americans are not informed. They have no real idea what's happening in this region, here in Russia or 600 miles away in Ukraine. But they should know. They're paying for much of it in ways they might this not believe yet. Bro. <laughs> He sucks so bad. What are you gonna do? Are you gonna fucking hit? Oh, what? What are you doing? I hope you know after you get his cards, I'm just gonna kill you now. Ah. Uh, it's a 1v1 against me and. <sighs> okay. Oh, I thought that he was gonna only get. Still. I kill him. Yeah, I think that that's the. I think that that's the shtick that we're going to do here. We're just going to go through and get pop, 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 pop. All of this. You need to attack my territory? I'm gonna kill you. I think I moved this way. Move through blue. Yeah. Don't tell me what to do.
There we go. we're done for the day. Yeah, it's 10 o'clock. We're done. Peace.